<laughs> oh my god, that sound effect is really cute! Victini is not one of the better legendary Pokemon out there. It's not terrible, though. Try this for fun if you have a Liberty Pass lying around on an old cartridge and you want basically easy mode for a repeat playthrough. It has a darn solid signature move called Searing Shot. Has 100 power, 100 accuracy, special fire type damage with a 30% chance to burn. Excellent chances. I'm sure that if you know anything about Victini, the move V-Create comes to mind, which is its other signature move. It has 180 power, special fire type damage, and a 95% accuracy chance in return for lowering Victini's defense, special defense, and speed after damage is dealt. This might be the best attacking move of all time in that it is the strongest move in the game that does not cause the user to faint, and Victini's ability of Victory Star makes it impossible for this to miss under normal circumstances. But as much as V-Create would be a positive, none of that matters. A Victini caught in the wild will never have this move. It's only available through long discontinued distributions. One of the reasons that I said that this Victini is good but a little disappointing is that Victini was often distributed with lots of signature moves of a bunch of other Pokemon, which is a big reason why you'd want to use it and what made it really popular to use. This is the beginning of a trend that I can't stand. Why is it that a Victini caught in the wild that you yourself have to work really hard to get is vastly inferior in every way to a Victini that's just given to you for free by a download. I can't stand that. You have to download an event anyway in the case of Victini to be able to fight it, so oops, you should have known better than to work hard and catch your own Victini. But if you can get past all that, it's got good stats, got good enough moves, but it's not winning a ton of awards because what makes Victini so great is cut off from it for no good reason. Just. Why even bother giving it a signature move at all if it could only learn it through some discontinued service that died in 2011? Well, as per usual, we have three Pokemon that can accompany us on the beginning of our journey. And as per usual, I think we should get to know these guys a little better before making a choice. And of course, when talking about a group of three starters, where else would we start than the grass type? Snivy! Let's get this started on the right foot, because, yeah, apparently snakes have those now. I mean, just look at it. <laughs> Snivy I would describe as being the most challenging out of these three. Of all the things it could be, because, you know, it totally looks like one, it's a speedy tank, a pretty uncommon mix of traits there. It has the advantage of being a tank that will frequently go first in battle to use buffs on itself before it can take any damage, but the stat distribution is weird and it might not be useful all that terribly often. The pure grass type is also known for not being exactly tanky, and it's stuck with that type for life, having many common weaknesses, and because of that, it takes some skill to know when and how to use it. It's also notorious for falling behind the rest of the team for a little while, since it gets Leaf Tornado soon enough in the early levels, which is fine for then, but it doesn't get anything better until level 32, causing it to really not hit all that hard for a while. And of course, because it's the start of a Pokemon journey, and this is a Pokemon journey, there's lots of poison and bug types that you're gonna have to deal with for a little while toward the beginning, so make sure that the first teammate you catch for Snivy complements it very well and can cover those weaknesses. All in all, Snivy is great for series veterans who might be looking for a little bit more of a challenge, but might be a little bit frustrating for first-timers who are still getting used to the ropes. Um, I guess now that I say it out loud, this wasn't really starting things off on the right foot after all. But that's okay, because next up, he's a fire type, he's Tepig. Let's get the big bad out of the way first. Tepig will eventually evolve into yet another fire fighting type. Listen, I respect the first responder firefighters as much as the next guy, but three times in a row? You think that's enough times, guys? Ugh. I'm sorry, I've never gotten over this, and I know a lot of other people haven't either. I mean, just look at it. It looks like it should be a fire dark type, and that would be so much cooler, but I guess we're still a few generations away from that happening, so we'll get our wish another day. Picking ourselves up, though, Tepig is, once again, pretty tanky. It's more of a traditional tank in having lots of HP and solid attacking stats that allow it to hit hard once it gets to move. In fact, it's so extreme in these concepts that as of this point in the series, this family has the highest HP and attack of any starter Pokemon. 
Fire and Fighting both individually have very good type coverage, and to complement that, Tepig even gets Flame Charge early, which not only hits pretty darn hard for early game moves, but also makes up for its poor speed, buffing your speed every turn that you use it. It's once again not what I would expect from a type that isn't the definition of defensive, but I'd say it's a little bit easier going than Snivy is. In the later levels, Tepig is going to get high-powered recoil moves, complemented by the fact that it has lots of beefy HP to absorb that recoil. And last to be gone over, probably last to get picked in PE as well, Oshawott! With slightly less HP than Tepig, but more defense to back it up, we are 3 for 3 on having tanky starters. While Oshawott isn't going to be sweeping through most teams without getting hit itself, it's a bulky mixed attacker that's at least respectably so. In the way of attacking, there's not a whole lot of variety in the types of good moves it can learn, which is probably the biggest challenge when raising it. Water is the only type that it gets other than, of course, normal for a little while, and beyond that, its type coverage isn't as good as, say, Tepig. Oshawott is very well balanced and a respectable team member, but I'm aware that there are some people out there who don't like using their starter Pokémon throughout the whole adventure and like boxing it after a certain point. I do not plan on doing that with the Pokémon that I choose, but if you want to do that, I would recommend Oshawott the most out of these three for reasons that we'll see later. Alright, so, all fairly defensive in their playstyles, but a little bit different in how they're actually going to be fighting. Really, I feel like I could roll with any one of these, but there is one in particular that resonates with me a little bit more than the others. I was always last to get picked in gym as well, so come here, you little freckled guy, we're gonna face the world together! Patrat! So I'm pretty sure the first time any of us looked at Patrat, we said, Oh hey, this is the Bidoof of this game, and I should definitely catch it and teach it lots of HM moves! No. It's actually a terrible HM user. So if Unova's Route 1 normal type isn't good for HM moves at all, then what is it good for? Well, exactly what you'd expect. Not much. Its stats are painfully below average across the board. It'll fall behind the rest of most any team. And its runaway ability eventually becomes Illuminate after it evolves, which actually increases wild Pokemon encounter rates. So its abilities range from outright bad to actively hurting you to have it on the team. The only good things I can say about it are that it learns Crunch at level 16 and Hypnosis at level 18, but that's where the positives end, and besides that, it just learns a bunch of normal type moves for the most part. In fact, Patrat as it is now is so bad, it has the dubious honor of having the lowest stats of any Unovan Pokemon. Yeah, it's objectively the worst one! <laughs> Man, I hope the next one is a little bit more positive, because I kind of don't feel like I've been the most positive on these guys right away. Well, okay. All right, we're starting off with Watchog. <laughs> Regardless of your opinion of the site, I think we can all put our competitive play preferences aside and come together to agree with Smoggin's description of Watchog. Game Freak must have said, Let's take an overdone concept, make it as shitty as possible, give it the creepiest eyes known to Pokemon, and release it into the world just to watch the Pokemon fandom squirm. I don't have anything new to add. I was gonna bash it for the same reasons as Patrat, but they did it all for me. Next up is Lillipup. Read its ability. Pick it up. Okay, so I'm paraphrasing a little bit to spin things in my agenda, but still! Even if it doesn't perfectly translate, you get the point. Pickup is an overpowered ability for the starting trainer, granting you tons of items that won't be even available for purchase for a long time. I see the challenge that Charon and Bianca gave us as kind of an invitation to fill the other five slots of our party with pickup Lillipups, because why not? We're waiting on team members, we're not doing anything with those slots. We might as well take advantage of it and get lots of cool items. Oh, uh, right, I should probably actually go over how this works as an actual team member. Well, when raising it, discard everything that I just said, because Vital Spirit, if it's caught with that, will become one of the best abilities in the game, Intimidate. This lowers the foe's attack at the start of a battle just from sending out the Pokémon. In fact, Lillipup and its evolutions are one of only two families in all of Unova to have this ability, so if you want it, that might be reason enough to pick it as it is. It's a lot more useful than Pickup turning into Sand Rush, which is barely going to get any use in single player. For now, Lillipup's pretty fast, and it does a lot of damage in nearly every battle. 
Tackle's actually been buffed. It's now 50 power instead of 35, and as if that weren't good enough, Lillipup is gonna learn takedown early on. It's got powerful normal type moves for what it is. It even eventually gets access to the elemental fangs after it's fully evolved, and this sounds great, but unfortunately, that's about where the positives end. Lillipup's biggest selling point is the fact that it has decent bulk, backed up by the fact that it has Intimidate to lower the opponent's attacks. The big problem is its horrible special attack that just totally stinks, and that especially stinks because it actually learned some pretty darn good special moves that it's not gonna get much use out of. Other than that, it pretty much just learns a bunch of normal type moves, and most other attacks it learns just aren't that exciting or strong. All around, a decent Pokemon that learns some strong moves right now, but doesn't get a lot of strong moves later. Hurtier! At long last, the opportunity to skip raising a Lillipup entirely. When caught, it's close to evolving and will know Crunch as a notable move. Again, the main reason to use this is for Intimidate, a strong use of Return, and the Elemental Fangs. Speaking of which, very rarely, 5% in Rustling Grass, the fully evolved Stoutland can be yours. Personally, I don't think it's worth to hunt this thing down when Hurtier evolves so soon anyway and is pretty capable, but there's somewhat of a novelty to having this early, and it has very high stats compared to most of what's available. But what makes Hurtier and Stoutland special is that if you wanted to use the Elemental Fangs, they're coming right up and they're gonna be able to learn them very soon. Purloin! Purloin is fast. That's a blanket statement that's gonna be true throughout its entire life. It's meant to function as a mixed attacker and also a disruptor, moving first due to its high speed and using moves that debuff and cripple enemies. Unfortunately, just because it's meant to do that doesn't mean it totally succeeds. Like so many other Pokemon that we have talked about as of yet, its stats are likely to fall behind the rest of the team after too long, and if it just barely misses a one-shot, it's super frail and can't really take hits. It also doesn't help that a lot of its moves that make it usable are at high levels, and its best way of doing damage from level 15 all the way up to 34 is Pursuit. The move that you're gonna be holding out for until then is Slash. Doesn't even get the same time attack bonus. It gets a few good moves from other sources, but it's hard to use as anything more than a temporary team member, unfortunately. And that's seriously it for this route. Lightbird. I didn't like you on Route 2 when your only competition was Lillipup, and I especially don't like you now that you're competing with Sandile and Scraggy for being a good dark type. It's meant to be a mixed sweeper, but its moves are pretty bad. Thankfully, if caught here, it starts with Fake Out, and it outspeeds a lot of things, but it's pretty lacking long term. Its total stats are very low compared to pretty much anything else, and we've had better dark types available for, what, three areas now? Next. Just like there are three starters, there are three elemental monkeys, and depending on which starter you chose, you'll get the monkey that complements your starter's weakness. Starting off, for those who chose Tepig, you get Pansage. These three Pokemon are not award-winning by any means, but they're the absolute most convenient way of getting through the few battles we have coming up. Think of them like a type effectiveness tutorial that you have no good reason not to use for at least a few battles. If you want to keep them on your team long term, that's a completely different story. Pansage's main method of attacking is Vine Whip, which isn't great, but it's something, I guess. The issues are that it's horribly weak until it evolves, it's not going to evolve for a while, and until then, the moves it has are... bad. <laughs> These guys are the first of many stone evolution Pokemon that we'll be seeing on our travels. For the uninitiated, typically if a Pokemon evolves using a stone, its level up moves will either drastically change after evolution, or it'll stop learning moves through level up altogether. In this case, I recommend waiting until at least level 22 before evolving, because they get better moves of their own type at that point. In this case, Seed Bomb. Moving on, if you started with Oshawott, you get nothing! Good day, sir! Seriously, it might as well be that. Panseer is easily the worst of these three. Just only getting Scratch, Incinerate, Lick, and Fury Swipes until level 22. It's just so incredibly weak on every single possible attacking front. Even though Flame Burst is pretty good when it gets up to that level 22, it's a downright slog to that point because it's so awful. There are many better fire types out there, so don't feel like you have to use this if you want one. Speaking of someone who has used this on their team before, good luck. 
You wouldn't think that Incinerate being only 5 power less than Vine Whip would be too awful, but I've had it be quad effective with same type attack bonus and still only do about half the opponent's health when they were the same level as Panseer. <sighs> it's just, it's such a painful slog. I don't recommend it for anything beyond the starting stretch, but if you want to go for it, it's not horrible after the beginning. Last up is Panpour, and let me tell you, they took pity on the people who started with Snivy because this is probably the best out of the three. Its starting attack is Water Gun, making it the strongest damage-wise out of the gate for these three. The move it gets at level 22 is Scald, a water-type move with the capability to burn the enemy while also doing damage. It's just a really neat move and not something that you'd immediately expect, but makes total sense for a water type to have, at least in some capacity. There's also not a lot of great water types in Unova, so this has the distinction of not quite being as outclassed as the other two. All in all, if I had to recommend one monkey, it's this monkey. Oh, and you're not limited to just one monkey per playthrough. You can totally catch these guys in the wild later if you want to. Let's get started with Muna. A psychic type tank. Okay, interesting idea. Welcome to Unova, everyone. Muna is our first Pokemon to evolve with a Moonstone, which we're not far away from getting at all. But as great as that sounds, you don't want to evolve it too soon. It's very impressive that it gets Psybeam at only level 11, and it also gets Hypnosis at a low level, definitely giving Patrat a run for its money. The big problem is that it doesn't learn Psychic until level 37, and there's no TM for it during the main adventure. You're gonna be lugging around this weak Muna for just so long, and speaking of someone who's done it, it's tough. While it does learn other good TMs, it's a huge disappointment having to hold out that long unevolved that it might just make it unviable for most people. I mean, come on! It has 25 attack, and its strongest move before then is Zen Headbutt. I don't know what they were expecting you to do with it. Well, let's see if we can do better with this. If you're patient enough to wait for a 5% encounter rate in Rustling Grass, you can encounter an already evolved Musharna. This will always be level 11 and will always have the moveset of Defense Curl, Lucky Chance, Psy Beam, and Hypnosis, which it is stuck for for life unless you use TMs. But all is not bad with this one. Should you happen to run into it, it has by far the highest stats of anything we've seen up to this point. It's factually the strongest Pokemon available for a long time, and it would make for a ruthlessly strong temporary team member, or maybe even a permanent team member, if you're willing to get past the fact that it's probably not going to learn Psychic for a long time. Yes, Mushar. Of course it's Mushar. What else would it be? Musharna! We've already been over this, haven't we? But this is something kind of intriguing. Thankfully, now we have a big arsenal of TM, so if you regretted not getting it, you can actually teach it nice moves without having to wait 30 levels. This is being gone over again because even though it is the same Pokemon as before, it has a different ability. This is our second, technically third instance of hidden abilities after Darmanitan and Basculin. Basically, these are abilities that drastically change a Pokemon's use but can only be found through special ways or gotten from special events. Collecting all of these is brutal, but this is one of the few freebies that you get. Telepathy isn't super useful on Musharna in a world where almost no one plays double or triple battles. If you wanted to use it for Battle Subway or Versus or something of that persuasion, I guess you'd find use in it because then it's able to tank a lot better, but still, I'm not really so sure. It's kind of lame that the only two Pokemon with hidden abilities in the game that introduce the mechanic both suck and are better off with their default abilities. Edove is good so badly, but I just can't in good conscience. Hear me out with this. Pidove learns good moves. Pidove has a good ability in Super Luck that complements Air Cutter. It's compatible with the workup TM we just got, so where's the problem? All of its good moves are special based, and Pidove has laughable special attack. For some reason, they focused its stats on attack, even though none of its best moves take any advantage of it. It could have been good if its attack and special attack were just flipped. It would have made it unique too. It was so close to being good, and come 
on. Just if you were only introduced in Hoenn before the physical special split, you could have enjoyed brief success. I love you, Peta, even if the people who made you don't. Under the pinwheel forest dark grass, we have Tranquil. Every bad thing I said about Peta applies. It wants to be a good special attacker, but it lacks any capabilities for doing so. Well, maybe not any, but still pretty bad. Air Cutter is decent, and it starts out with that. I'll also give it points for starting with Roost if it's caught here. That makes it so that it heals half of its own HP in return for being susceptible to ground type moves for that turn. It's a pretty good move, and it made a lot of flying types better than they would have been without it. Of course, I think you could do a lot better. What's the opposite of pheasant? Unpheasant. Whatever. At a 5% encounter rate, or 2.5% if you want the not hideous form of it, you can find Unpheasant in Rustling Grass. It's always level 22, has the exact same moves as any Tranquil that you can catch right now, so it's the same thing but with higher stats, though again, its stat distribution is pretty lame. Its form differences are purely cosmetic, bringing it up because it's one of very few Unovan Pokemon that actually has a gender difference in that the males are a lot more showy looking for attracting mates, and the females are more built for flying. Pretty realistic, and I at least like that about it. Blitzel! Both abilities make it immune to electric no matter which one you pick, while also giving it at least some kind of buff whenever it gets hit by one. Pick your poison and switch in when predicting an electric move from the foe. It might take a little time to evolve, but it's hardly helpless with an ability that good either way you go, and respectable speed. The most outright bad thing that I can say about it is that once again, its attack and special attack are flipped from what its moves are, where it doesn't learn nearly as many good physical moves as it does good special moves for whatever reason. It's nowhere near as bad as p -Dove, and there's still a lot to love here. But what is it with this root and having backward stats on everything? Now you too can enjoy having a butt in your face for a 40 hour RPG! Zeb Striker. Uh, you know, just in case you were jealous of me. Um, very fast, both abilities are great, and it has an electric immunity regardless of which one you pick. Comes with flame charge and spark, so it's good to fight right away. Worst thing about it is that a lot of its compatible moves are special when it's just not meant for that, as I've said quite a few times. Soon enough, you will acquire a strong dislike for the buffed sturdy ability, and how often Rog and Rolla loves to show its ugly ear with it, because that's what its face is, it's just an ear. Its common weaknesses to grass and water aren't as bad as they are here as they are with most other rock type tanks, because it is pure rock type and not part ground giving it a quad weakness. This is strictly a physical tank. Ridiculously slow, but ridiculously good defense and attack. It only has rock blast for a physical rock type move until level 30 when it gets rock slide, so be wary of that. There's far more opportunities to raise this family later, so if it sounds interesting but tough to use for right now, just wait on it. There's no rush whatsoever. Just make sure that you can trade to evolve it even after Nintendo Wi-Fi connection is shut down, or else its fully evolved stats are going to look like this instead. Oh, and uh, de-equip its Everstone if it has one. I might have just saved your life. Boldor. Okay, this one's strange. And no, I'm not talking about the fact that its face is a flat nose. <laughs> its moves are pretty darn awful when you catch it in the Chargestone Cave. Its main move is Smackdown because its stats are downright horrible at using Power Gem. It learns Rock Slide pretty quick, which would be a lot better if double battles were just, well, more common. Yet again, it seems like a lot of Pokemon run into this problem. The main attraction here is that it can immediately evolve into Gigalith when traded, and its physical stats are amazing once you do that. You don't miss out on a single level up move by evolving right away either, so you might as well just take the higher stats if you can do that. If you want a rock type, Gigalith can be a decent enough wall, even if its type is weak to a lot of common types. Thankfully, it doesn't have any quad weaknesses because of it just being a pure rock type. Smackdown also leads to some potentially fun setups, since it removes the ground immunity from whoever it hits. Second, we have Woobat! Woo, this thing is fast! Even as an unevolved Pokemon, it is one of the fastest Pokemon possible with our measly one badge. It's fast, but it's not really a sweeper per se. The name of the game with Woobat is instead going first, inflicting confusion, attraction, or flinches, making it so that your opponent has to roll the dice to be able to even move. It even has a signature move at level 15 called Heart Stamp that works with this. 
Heart Stamp is not a bad move by any means, but I'd say you're better off replacing it with Air Slash once you get the chance to learn it. It's yet another unorthodox and very unique Pokemon here, so points for originality. Psychic Flying is also an awkward type for a lot of Pokemon to deal with, so it can definitely hold its own. It's not perfect, but hey, that's miles better than the mountains of crap that filled the last eight areas or so. And all the way from Mother 3, it's Drillbur! Okay, this one's a bit quirky. It's tough. It's hard hitting. It's able to take damage well, and it learns Earthquake leveling up, Rock Slide leveling up, Swords Dance leveling up. Pretty decent TM compatibility as well. Sand Rush, for its ability, makes it one of the best Pokemon to use Sandstorm with out there. Has an amazing defensive type of Steel Ground after it evolves, it resists many common types, and even makes it a sweeper that is immune to both paralysis and poison. It's hard to stop. It's almost unfair how good Drillbur is. It can even get Earthquake early by just waiting two extra levels to evolve. I'd recommend that you do that. Heck, it even has an uncommon move called Drill Run that might be worth considering just for fun. It's a weaker, slightly less accurate Earthquake that has a high critical hit chance. There is no doubt that Drillbur is one of the absolute best options out there. It's amazing in so many ways. But I did say that it was quirky. And really, that just comes down to saying that its moves if caught in Wellspring Cave aren't that strong and don't get better for a bit, but if you don't want to deal with that, there's plenty more opportunities to catch it later. Seriously, it's a great Pokemon, and you might not even have to deal with that downside if you wait on it a little bit. Excadrill. Between Sand Rush doubling its speed and a gigantic 135 attack, it's a near unstoppable force on a team that is packing Sandstorm. It's even better than I made Drillbert sound all that time ago because it starts with Earthquake and Rock Slide. Nothing more to it. It's one of the best Pokemon you can use. You see that rustling bit of grass? That's something that's a little bit new. Should we go into it? Dramatic battle music! What's this mean? I don't know. No, seriously. I don't know. Autono is a Pokemon of gimmicks, right down to the pronunciation of its name. <laughs> For one, it has an unusually high experience yield when it's defeated. It's nowhere near the highest of any Pokemon ever, like some people might say, but it's still pretty darn good and it's reliably encountered because it's almost always in Rustling Grass, and of course you can see Rustling Grass on the field, so that makes it a great Pokemon to grind against. For two, Regenerator is a rare ability that is amazing if you are playing with shift battles. That would be reason enough to consider it on its own because you're gonna be benefiting from it all the time if you're playing on that difficulty. And for three, it learns almost every TM move in the game, to the point where there's almost as many possible movesets for Autono as there are Autono themselves. It also has very respectable stats for right now, and it's also physically bulky, which is a bit unique, since almost all normal types are just special walls, and this one's, well, both. But, and here it comes. It works best right now because it's pretty likely to fall behind because its stats aren't anything special later on. If you still want to use it, I wouldn't say that it's awful, and really the most fun thing to do with it is collecting lots and lots of TMs, as many as you can, and just retooling Odno's moveset for each new area so that it can just do whatever is required there. I'm glad that of all games, the one that made TMs infinite use introduced a Pokemon with high TM compatibility, because it does a great job showcasing something that wasn't possible before now. Well, okay, it was possible to the very stupid choice, but you know what I mean. Wow Timber is a good Pokemon, but it takes a little while to get off the ground. The only other big negative is that it needs to be traded to fully evolve, and if you can't do that, it might make it unviable for you. If you can, though, Monstrous Attack, good physical tanking prowess, crummy speed, Guts is an awesome ability, strong moves, and that's how it stays for life. Its starting stats look nice, but those full stats are downright beautiful. I will warn you though, the only fighting type move it starts with is Low Kick, and it's a little bit before it learns Wake Up Slap. If you were looking for a short term fighting type Pokemon to help you take on that gym, probably not the best option for that. 
The poor speed with those limited moves early on can make it feel a bit slow, but once it gets far, it's great. It might only use fighting and rock type moves for the majority of the journey, but do you really need it to do anything else when it does those things so well? I wouldn't think so. And besides, its level up moves are pretty solid too. I sang very high praise of Timber, or didn't as your ears thank me. Girder is the same hard hitting bulky fighting type with great moves that you know and love. By catching it later as a girder, you get around the fact that Timber's moves could make it a little bit hard and easy to use at times. The greatest downside, once again, is that it only lives up to all the hype if you can trade. But if you can, it can evolve right away and there is zero difference when it learns its leveling up moves, so you might as well take the amazing stats. Timpole is as squishy as it looks. Those headphones are not made of hard plastic. It starts off with respectable speed and poor defenses. What's awesome and makes it useful out of the gate is that it outspeeds most things at this point. It's guaranteed to start off with Bubble Beam and it's soon going to learn Mud Shot. But for now, let's get into the biggest love for Temple. You love the water ground type. I love the water ground type. And this becomes the only water ground type in all of Unova. Speaking of evolution, it gradually becomes more of an all around Pokemon with decent to good stats at everything as time goes by. That combined with only being weak to grass makes it a little more capable of tanking than weak little old Temple would have you think. The only real flaws are that its abilities both get use in rain and that Mudshot is its only ground type move it gets through level up, but if you can get past that, it can function on pretty much any team and you could do a lot worse for a water type if you don't have the snivy privilege of having a free pan pour. Oh, and uh, if it has swift swim, it'll eventually lose that ability for poison touch, which makes this the only time a non-poison type has ever gotten that ability. Let the hate flow through you, says Emperor Palpatode. Fear its water ground type, good for offense and defense. Its family has no especially bad stats, and its abilities are interesting. No wonder it was able to create an empire. But seriously, note that hydration becomes poison touch when it evolves. I made a mistake by getting this backwards last time by saying Swift Swim becomes poison touch. That's not the case. It still stands, however, that this is the only non-poison type to get poison touch for an ability. If you skip Timpole, it's a pretty great opportunity to catch Palpatode right now. You have your Surf Age Gem and it's only a few levels away from evolving. It gets rid of pretty much anything bad about raising Timpole. The only real warning I'd give is that Mudshot and Bulldoze are your only options for ground moves on it for a while. But if you want something a little bit better, found very rarely in Rippling Water only, Seismitoad can appear anywhere from level 15 all the way to 40. Again, I kind of wonder how many level 15 Seismitoads exist in the world. It's data I would really like to know. Anyway, it's powerful and can fight right out of the box. Or ball, actually, with Pokemon terminology. The only real notable difference is that it learns Dig Through TM when Palpitoad cannot. Next, encountered normally in white and a rare encounter in Rustling Grass if you're playing black, Throw! with an H, not a W, big distinction. Right away, this is something you'll definitely want to consider if you're unsure what you're gonna do against the Nacarine Gym Leader. Immediately apparent is that it's a good tank and has solid attack. Guts is a great ability, and if you can set up, it's good to get poison on purpose and then just bring it into a boss fight and do ridiculous amounts of damage. This is a poor man's timber. While it's outclassed by Timber's final evolved form, it's good now, it learns stronger moves at low levels, and you don't need to worry about trading to evolve it. So when I say outclassed, I mean that it's definitely the choice for you if you wanted a fighting type and you're just not able to trade to fully evolve Timber. Aside from that, every single attack throw learns leveling up is normal or fighting type, Timber is available in the same area for the first time. Timber evolves into another fighting type tank with guts for its ability and better attack than throw, as well as move compatibility so samey across the two they might as well have the same move pools. It's basically an immediately far better Timber, but not quite as usable as Conkelder. But outclassed as it may be, I would not say that it's bad. Lastly, as you would guess, with its encounter rates flipped between black and white, it's Sock! Not spelled S-O-C-K. It's the speedier, harder hitting cousin of throw. To make up for lower defenses, it has Sturdy for its ability, which might be good for the upcoming gym battle, since there's a Pokemon there that does a ton of damage on its first turn. Also a little nicer than the fighting types we've seen so far is that it starts with double kick, so it can fight relatively well right away. 
but I don't know if I'd say that it holds up over time quite as solid as Throw does. While it definitely is trying to be different from the Timber family, its TM compatibility is the exact same again, its level up moves are all normal in fighting type again, and you're gonna find better sweepers in terms of stats in the not too distant future. But if you want a sweeper with sturdy for its ability, making it so that even when it is out speed it can't be knocked off the field with one hit, that would be a reason to consider Sock in and of itself. It's certainly unique. Starting this off especially, can we take Pinwheel Forest to appreciate how great the early bug types are here? Wow, a caterpillar cocoon family that is not useless after the very start. That grass bug type is immediately the biggest hurdle. It's awful defensively and it's difficult to slot into a team roster. But if you can just get past that one big negative, the combination of grass and bug same type attack bonus is an amazing offense. If you don't believe me, it starts with Bug Bite and Razor Leaf at only level 15. It's good to go out of the box and cover so many types right away. It evolves soon and you're not far off from being able to do a trick that makes happiness evolutions instant, so don't worry about it needing happiness to evolve fully. It's a decent sweeper with decent stats all around, and both of its abilities complement this well. Leave the ability choice to just whatever other Pokemon you're using it with. Personally, I think you're gonna pick Swarm regardless though. Also, it gets Leaf Blade, X Scissor, and Swords Dance naturally. This epitomizes hard to use, but darn powerful when you know what you're doing. Flipping that in its head, every great thing I said about Swaddle applies with Swadloon. It starts with Bug Bite and Razor Leaf, doesn't learn more moves until it evolves, but who cares, that's all it needs until then. The only downside for not catching it as a Swaddle is that it will never learn Endure, Flail, or Bug Buzz, so if you regretted not getting it, regret nothing now. It's so great how the bugs were treated and how they're actually viable. And then 5% of the time, also in Rustling Grass, is Levani. Don't hold your breath for finding it, but it's darn powerful stat-wise. It will always come with the moves Struggle Bug, Razor Leaf, Bug Bite, and String Shot, so if you do somehow get lucky enough to get it, might as well take it. Venipede! Okay, so this one's not quite as great out of the box, mainly attacking with Poison Sting in Pursuit, but it does get Poison Tail and Bug Bite soon. Both pretty respectable moves. This is the more speed-focused cousin of Sawaddle who is more attack-focused. Something unique is that its evolved form Whirlipede is easily one of the best tanks that you could have right now. So if you're in need of a temporary tanky Pokemon, it can serve as your tank right now and then become a fast sweeper at a later point after you've gotten a tank that you're holding out for. I like Swarm the best of its abilities, but the other one is not useless by any means when it's meant to take some physical hits. Now to get to the downsides of Venipede. All it learns are bug, poison, and normal type moves until it's fully evolved. It may not seem like it has much variety in its moves, but once fully evolved, that all changes and it learns tons of real hits. Not even just through TMs either. It has exclusive access to Steamroller, which is a 65 power physical bug type move with a 30% chance to flinch. On a Pokemon this fast, chances to flinch that are that high are dang good. This is just another Pokemon that adds to my ever-growing love for the underrated poison type. Whirlipede is as great as it ever was. It's a tank that turns into an attacker in just a few levels. Both abilities are pretty helpful in the context that we're talking about, and it starts with Bug Bite, Iron Defense, Poison Tail, and Protect. Really good to go. What's nice is that the downsides of raising a Venipede are not so with Whirlipede. Couldn't ask for anything more out of an evolved wild Pokemon. Cottony. Get Prankster, seriously. <laughs> Just as simple as that. It gives priority to moves like Charm, Tailwind, the Powder moves, and especially so, Cotton Guard. A move that not many Pokemon learn, but raises defense by a whopping three stages. It has some great speed going for it, but giving outright priority to these moves makes it so much more useful in battle than it would be without it. That's sadly about where the positives for Cottony end. It's a status inflictor more than anything else. I really liked Cottony in concept, and I even wanted to use it for a little while, but it's hard to recommend in this context, because a lot of what makes Cottony great comes up in later games. We're coming up on the Sunstone, it needs to evolve pretty soon, but it needs to reach the absolutely disgusting level of 37 as a Cottony, just to gain access to Cotton Guard. Until then, its stats are pretty awful and it's hard to use. 
it's yet another case of the stats and moves that await you if you're able to survive the grind are very rewarding, but the grind is just so long that I feel like your time could be better spent raising pretty much anything else, and it's a shame, because Cottony definitely has potential and it's very cute looking. Its evolved form Whimsicott can be found in the rustling grass around here, but despite starting with higher stats, I don't recommend it since, again, most of its best moves can only be learned as a Cottony. And as you would expect, because we're just going over counterparts one after another, we're moving on to Petalil. This Pokemon does one thing. Sleep Powder, Quiver Dance, Spam Petal Dance with own tempo, and then Giga Drain when it needs to heal. Okay, so that's four things, but you know what I'm saying! This might sound awful, but hear me out on this one. It comes with Sleep Powder, and it will have no shortage of good Grass-type moves coming in until it fills out with that one good move set I just mentioned. Giga Drain is a great move that it gets early on due to some buffs that it received in black and white. It now has 10 PP instead of the old 5, and it has higher base power. You can rely on it in battle far more often than previously. Petal Dance might not be available until very late, but to get this moveset put together, you want to evolve Petalil at level 26 or 27. No later, and that's a lot better than what Cottony has to deal with. It's the epitome of a one-trick pony that does its job well, but is held back by its bad type coverage because it only learns grass and normal type moves, with the exception of Dream Eater, which, why would you want to learn that when you have a healing move already that doesn't have to rely on sleep? Once it has that one moveset filled out, it's very powerful and can sweep through whole teams, even just doing neutral damage. Again, its evolved form Lilligant is in rustling grass here, but I recommend catching it as a Petalil for the same reasons as Whimsicott. Basculin is a Pokemon with two different appearances, and they're actually more than cosmetic. If you are playing black version, red Basculins are common, whereas in white version, blue are common. This is the first of any Pokemon to have three regular abilities, but here upon its debut, it worked weird. Well, okay. In all later appearances of Basculin, and what you're probably used to, is that its abilities will be different based on what color a stripe it has, making it so that it can normally have three different abilities. But specifically in black and white, they both can have reckless or adaptability. The third ability, Rockhead, is treated as a hidden ability instead. In white version only, not in black version, this trade gives a blue Basculin with Rockhead for its ability. In black version, you just get a normal, boring red Basculin with Reckless for its ability. Does this mean anything at all? Of course not, because you would want adaptability anyway, so the special ability that you can only get in white version is completely pointless. What a great difference, right? All of this to not even get started on explaining the Pokemon itself, so what does Basculin itself do? Generally, it's probably going to wind up using Aqua Jet Crunch and Aqua Tail for you. Its TM compatibility is bad. It learns only normal attacks, water attacks, and ice beam. It's not too horrible of a Pokemon, and adaptability is very cool, but in terms of raw stats and moves, it's outclassed by Simipore in every single way, other than exactly two more points of defense that Basculin has over it. Uh, oh! Encounter time! Basculin! All right, I guess it's time to talk about this. Kinda going over Basculin once again. You will find the blue stripe variant commonly while surfing pretty much all around Unova in any fresh water that you go through if you are playing white version. In any sort of rippling water, which we've seen occasionally when walking past water up to this point, you'll be more likely to find the red stripe basculin. If you're playing black version, it's going to be the other way around where red is common all the time and blue is the one that you find in rippling water. Sandile! Man, this is a Pokemon with two abilities so good I can never make up my mind on which one I want. Intimidate is the immediate threat, while Moxie has huge potential if it can get started up. But, you know, they're both great, so let's just get past that. Ground Dark is an interesting type with two immunities and good offense. It comes with some of the better attack and speed that we've seen up to this point, and it'll continue to develop those stats as it goes along. But it also has some decent bulk when it's fully evolved too, so I don't want to discount that either. This is already shaping up to be a huge positive, but it gets even better when it learns Crunch and even Earthquake naturally, plus has some good TM compatibility. But there is one catch to, well, catching it. <laughs> Make sure it's level 15 exactly. If it's higher level than that, it'll be stuck with Assurance for an attacking move, whereas level 15 Sandiles come with Bite instead. I have no idea why they gave it an awesome move at a low level and a crummy move at a higher level, but they did. 
It's also the only ground dark type in the game, so points for originality. Crocorock has a unique, pretty fun type that has two immunities, but is weak to some common types. Both of its abilities are great, and it comes with great moves. Plus, what's nice is that it's about to evolve. Easily the biggest draw is Moxie, since it's an uncommon ability, and if I've been making it look fun, there is no better opportunity to pick it up. Darumaka. It's okay to start out with 90 attack and being a decent bit tanky. Hustle also causes it to hit well whenever it works out, but hey, not much of anything special here, right? Oh, what am I kidding? Darmanitan! Man! Some men just want to watch the world burn with the almighty length of their fiery eyebrows, and that's what this is. At level 35, Darumaka evolves into one of the most powerful Pokemon you will find. Attack tied with Conkelder, great HP to let it be tanky, and good speed for what it is. As if 140 attack was not strong enough, its ability becomes sheer force. Explaining exactly how that works, if a move has any positive secondary effect, like a move that does damage but can also have a chance of burning, the secondary chance turns to 0% in exchange for the power increasing by a whopping 30%. Usually, I try to not primarily focus on just evolution so I can talk about what you're getting from the start, but Darmanitan is just so tough that it's impossible to recommend Darumaka without singing all the high praises of that evolved form. Whether you want your adventure to go quickly or you just hate the world, I recommend this. It's a good Pokemon to use when you're angry. <laughs> there is a chance to catch Darmanitan later, but I actually recommend catching Darumaka as it is now for reasons we'll see then. Now that we have a Rage Candy Bar from a certain Bye Bye A Go Go character that was in Isura City, we can give these to the statues. And we all know that when you try to feed a candy bar to a statue, it comes to life and attacks you! That'll learn you to share your candy. These Darmanitan are a rare instance of a Pokemon normally having their hidden ability, and swaps physical and special damage when it drops below 50% of its max HP. I've said before that Darmanit- no! Come on! Let's try that again. Luckily, I just saved, so I was able to use the magic of my omnipotent powers to not only change seasons, but also get another shot at this. As I was saying, these Darmanitan will always have Zen Mode, their hidden ability, and the only Pokemon that can have it. This ability adds a Psychic type and makes Darmanitan more defensive as well as swaps its physical and special attack when its HP drops below 50%. I've said before that Darmanitan is objectively one of the best Pokemon you can find. This is not included in that statement. And while it might sound nice being able to turn into a special attacker in the middle of a battle if you want to use special attacks, it's just not in your control, and it's greatly limiting itself by cutting it off from a chunk of its moveset depending on how much HP it has remaining. Plus, Zenmo drops the speed from 95 to 55 when it transforms, so a very likely scenario would be just barely not KOing the opponent, dropping below half your HP when they hit you, transforming, and no longer outspeeding the target when you could have gotten the KO if you still did outspeed them, causing you to lose the fight. We've had Darumaka available to us for so long, and there's just no reason to catch a wild Darmanitan if it always has Zen Mode for its ability, unless it's for personal novelty, or if you wanted to use Darmanitan but felt Vanilla was just too overpowered and wanted to gimp yourself somehow. Oh, and the only recovery move it even gets is Rest if you want to change it back without using an item. Even more limiting when you could just have a great physical moveset. Hey look, it's almost as forgettable as Finneon! Uh, I guess Univids wouldn't get that joke. But anyway, Maractus! First off, I want to mention its abilities because they're pretty funny. <laughs> water Absorb makes it immune to water, which is a neat and expected trait for a cactus Pokemon to have. It's not especially a great selling point, but it's still something I just like about it in concept alone. We've got some good attacking stats here with low speed, and that about sums it up. It's outclassed by so many other grass types that do the exact same thing, it's kind of nice that it can do so much damage and its abilities give you the choice of Sun Sweeper or Water Immunity, both of which aren't horrible. But its biggest sin is that almost all of its good moves are Grass type and it barely learns any TMs. I think Petalil and Sawaddle were both better options. What's amazing about its abilities though is that it's immune to water, but not sandstorms. <laughs> all of Maractus's natural habitats are always in perpetual sandstorms that hurt it. 
You'd think they would have died out long ago, but hey, I guess as long as you aren't taking your turn, you'd never lose health. Next up is the Webble. This is a tank. Don't let its puny size fool you. <laughs> it's fairly defensive to start out, and it gets a lot better when it evolves, though once again, that's pretty far away. Its type is unfortunately pretty lame for tanking. It only resists poison and normal, when poison is not a common offensive type whatsoever. Its saving graces come in its moves and abilities. Totally up to you which ability you want, because I think they both make it reliable. For moves, it always comes with Feint Attack and Smackdown, plus it will get Bug Bite and Stealth Rock almost immediately. Beyond that, it pretty much just learns great moves every two to five levels for the rest of your adventure, so there's no shortage of stuff coming in. Rock Slide, X Scissor, and remember when I praised Tier Tuga a little bit ago? Yeah, this gets Shell Smash as well, and I recommend it for the same reason. Its TM list has some real hits in there too, so try out different TMs as you get them. The more I fight along with my Pokemon, the happier I will be. We're gonna shove you off to the side because A, I don't want to justify that with a response, and B, we have one new encounter in this area found in dark grass. This is your only opportunity to catch Crustle. Recapping a little bit, it's a good physical wall with only three weaknesses, but sadly no immunities and only resistances to poison and normal. You know I use this family for HM moves. A lot of what I said before is true since Dwebble didn't really evolve too long after we could first catch it back in the desert resort, but now, Crustle has the respectable starting move set of Slash, Rock Slide, Stealth Rock, and Bug Bite. Even better, Heart Scales can remind it Shell Smash right away if you wanted to have a Pokemon with Shell Smash. It's pretty versatile, being a mediocre wall some of the time while being an attacker at other times. So if you don't like defensive Pokemon usually and didn't pick up Tier Tuga, this can be a fun alternative. It also learns X Scissor too, and hey, can't call that useless. For all of you who wouldn't put on a damn belt and thought it was a great idea to show the whole world your underpants in the early 2000s, Scraggy is on your head. Well, actually, that's not much of an insult, because Scraggy's good. This is yet another Pokemon that takes forever to evolve, are you sick of hearing me say that yet, but is rewarding if it can get that far. It's a bulky attacker, and because of that, I like to imagine the justification for its low speed and good defenses is that it just struts down the battlefield with its pants dragon on the ground really slowly and has so much swagger and is unfazed by anything, but... Head cannons aside, it starts with Headbutt, gets Brick Break at only level 20, and it gets Crunch later on. The biggest reason to use Scraggy is that it gets High Jump Kick, which normally that does damage to the user when it misses, but when combined with the wide lens we just got, is a terrific move with almost no downside. Both of its abilities have potential, but I think Moxie is going to be the one that most people choose. Do you want to use it? Well. It comes down to whether you think you can wait for it to evolve and whether or not you can get past the fashion sense. Sigilyph! Now here is a Pokemon I think is underrated. If you want a speedy psychic type attacker, this is straight up your only option. Both of its abilities are utterly fantastic, and what a better place to catch it where Magic Guard makes it immune to Sandstorm damage. By no means is that the only reason to consider Magic Guard, it's great in that it prevents damage from many sources, weather, status, ailments, a lot of indirect sources. It's compatible with a lot of TMs, but sadly a lot of the big hits are cut off from it, so it's going to use Psychic and Flying moves a lot. If you don't already have a Flying type or PETA have let you down with its terrible special attacking capabilities, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised by this guy. Tired of hearing me say that a Pokemon has bad stats and takes forever to evolve? Too bad! Yamask! It's stuck with low attacking stats for so long that it can be very frustrating to use, but its defenses are at least good. Its mummy ability can on its own be a counter to physical attackers, plus it learns Will-O-Wisp very soon after it's caught. Which is pretty darn unique at this point in time, in that it just burns and, as a result, halves the opponent's attack stat. It also starts with Hex, which is a 100 power ghost type move if the foe has a status ailment works pretty nicely and can hold its own if you do that combo. Big, however, incoming. I wouldn't recommend this because of the aforementioned problems, it's so frustrating to raise for so long, and to boot, it's one of the absolute slowest Pokemon and never gets faster even after it evolves, so it's kinda strictly a wall for a long time. Kafagrigus. It's a tanky ghost type with a downright gargantuan defense stat. It is such a good check to physical attackers since not only is it immune to normal in fighting, 
but also takes away their abilities if they make contact with it. Even better is that through heart scales or through TM, pick your poison, you can instantly teach it Will-O-Wisp to make it a wondrous breaker of physical attackers. It's by no means as horribly unplayable as Yamask was before. Thankfully, its stats are actually nice from the get-go. However, there is a big catch that comes with it. Moves. Its starting moves suck badly. Thankfully, Shadow Ball won't be hard to teach. But that's seriously it. Despite having a greatly respectable special attack stat, its only other notable special move it can learn in the main journey is Grass Knot. As a result, I consider it very lacking in its move pool. Really, if you're debating adding it to your team, consider it only as a physical wall and a good user of Shadow Ball. It's not unusable, but there's just nothing else to it. It's just a Pokemon that would be more useful if more TMs were accessible. We're gonna go back to Nacreen City. On the way back though, I bet you'd like to know which fossil you should choose, so let's get into that. When they are revived, they will be exactly level 25, so they are great to start fighting right after being born. It's best not thought about the logistics. But as for the cover fossil, it turns into Tirtuga. Its stats are pretty darn good to start out with, but it's one of the absolute slowest Pokemon in existence. To make up for this, Tirtuga starts out with Aqua Jet, a physical water type move with priority. You'll definitely get some good use out of that. It might even be able to beat weaker foes in one shot with it, but its main use is finishing off already damaged foes to avoid taking another hit and letting it tank for even more turns than it would have gotten to if it didn't have it. It's an alright tank, but I would say that the biggest drawback is its type being hard to slot into some rosters. Its type is definitely more geared toward offense type coverage than defense. Luckily for Tirtuga though, it doesn't have to just be a tank. I have been waiting to talk about this but it learns a move that not many Pokemon do, Shell Smash. Basically, you destroy your own defense and special defense by one stage in return for sharply raising attack, special attack, and speed. It's a big net gain in stats, and hands down one of the best new moves added in Unova. I think maybe even one of the best moves of all time. It brought competitive viability to many Pokemon, and it would be a reason to consider Tier 2 go all on its own. Beyond that, Shell Smash is such a good central part of Tier Tuga that that might decide which ability you want. Solid Rock is an amazing ability that again not many Pokemon have, but Sturdy guarantees that under most circumstances, Tier Tuga will get off at least one Shell Smash before getting knocked out, making it able to just do a lot more. I think Tier Tuga is one of the most interesting and fun Pokemon we've seen yet. It's great. The other fossil Pokemon, reborn from the Plume Fossil, Arken. This trend kind of started with slacking. A Pokemon with great moves and beyond legendary stats, but held back by an Achilles heel of an ability. In this case, Defeatist. Cuts the attack and special attack in half just for having half or less HP. There is no roundabout way of having a different ability on any Arken, they all have this ability. That's of course the biggest negative, but in terms of stats, even before it's evolved, just Wow, look at those stats. It's one of the strongest things we've seen yet, and it gets significantly better after it evolves. It's strictly an attacker and crippled after it takes a hit, but it's so darn good at what it does and learns strong moves from so many dang types. For all the Pokemon I've complained about having limited moves lately, this one stands out. You'll just have to play it very cautiously to make it work, because even though it has big positives, that one big negative is a big negative. Trubbish. Oh boy. Oh boy. It's time. This guy. I think he's underrated. Okay, so the pure poison type is a nice for type for common resistances. Like you didn't see that one coming from me, Mr. I love poison types. One might be inclined to think that it's trash because, well, it is, but. Its stats are okay all around. It's mainly used as a tank with decent speed, which is kind of unique. It learns Stockpile around the current levels, which is basically Curse without the speed drop, but it can only be stacked three times. It stacks up Stockpiles and then can outspeed some other tanks to hopefully flinch them with that stench ability. The worst part about Trubbish is that it barely learns any good physical moves at all, despite what its stats would have you think. Pretty much all of its good attacks are special, so it's often limited to just being a tank because it can't hit very hard. 
As a fun side note, it can be holding a nugget 1% of the time. There's gold in that there dumpster. How about we start off with your bestest, most closest favorite Pokemon in the whole wide wacky world? Garboder is a poison type tank with no especially bad stats aside from special attack and outspeeds lots of other tanks. Biggest downfall is that it barely learns any good physical attacks, as we have seen many times. Like everything we're about to see, the encounter rate is the same as it is in Dark Grass as it is in Light Grass, but the level is going to be significantly higher if caught in Dark Grass, so you have nothing to lose by trying to catch it there. Its starting moveset in Route 9 always has Body Slam and Sludge Bomb. Again, why Sludge Bomb and not Poison Jab? I'm just going to say it. Wow, look at this really cool Pokemon you can't have! For an unevolved Pokemon, Zoroa's speed and special attack are just simply terrific. The main reason to use this is Illusion. It'll appear as if it's the Pokemon in slot 6 of your party to your opponent, and is there so that your opponent will unknowingly hit a Dark-type Pokemon with a move that it actually resists or is immune to. Usually, a Psychic-type or Poison-type disguise is the way to go. While this sounds cool, it's unfortunately very lacking beyond that. It's a mixed attacker with an emphasis on special over physical, yet it only learns one special move leveling up, and it's at level 64. Just... Ew. Its physical level up moves also aren't even that good. It has to rely entirely on TMs to accomplish much of anything. Not even that, but most of its good TMs aren't even available to you for a super long time. I'm sorry. Maybe it's really not that bad that you're missing out on it, though, so I don't even know why I'm apologizing, but I didn't even recommend it in Versus that much. As soon as it was announced, everyone wanted to use it based on its ability, and then whoop, its debut game had Team Preview in Versus, so your opponent just knows your whole team ahead of time and knows to expect the disguise, but hey, it's not like you could obtain this Pokemon anyway, so what do you care? Zoro Arc! Well, Zoroa might have let us down, but this is the one absolutely one of the most powerful Pokemon you could conceivably have right now. That is, if you have access to an event that's been discontinued for years. Uh, so maybe this time I actually do mean it when I say, wow, look at this really cool Pokemon you can have! I can actually back myself up in that now. It's always level 25, not far away from learning Night Slash, but it suffers from the same problems as Zoroa, where it has a great special attack stat that it hardly ever gets to use, and its moves are very limited. If you do have means of using it, you should already know to pack a Psychic or Poison type in the last slot of your party so you can actually use its ability. Minchino. That doesn't make any sense. Um, regardless, it has good speed and it gets even faster, plus gains respectable attack after evolving. This is a one-trick pony, or chinchilla. I seem to be favoring that terminology a lot lately. I better knock it off because, you know, it doesn't really make any sense for anything but Blitzel. But you want Technician for its ability. It learns Tail Slap pretty quickly and can be taught Rock Blast and Bullet Seed after it evolves. These are its bread and butter. It uses two to five hit moves a lot, gets the buff from Technician, and makes every hit stronger. Even though the total base power is going to be higher than 60 after just three hits with these moves, it's a technicality that lets you get around the rules of the ability and use relatively high power moves with it. Another fun trick with it is using that scope lens that we got back in Castelia because it rolls for a critical on every individual hit for those moves. Yeah, it's all right and definitely something fun if you want something different. Very rarely you can find the fully evolved Chinchino and rustling grass around these parts, but I wouldn't count on it because it's just so rare and even if you do find it, it's not overly worth it. It'll have Tail Slap, Sing, Tickle, and Helping Hand with no other moves through level up ever because it's a stone evolution. It can be taught those other good moves later on, but you're better off just getting a Minchino and learning its moves through level up since you're going to obtain the shiny stone for it soon anyway. Next up, only in black version, is Gothita! Remember Muna? Well, whether you do or don't remember the walk-in cookie jar. So continues the trend of Gen 5 having lots of Psychic-type tanks. Of all things, this is a special wall, because, you know, it totally looks like one. It starts with Psybeam, which is pretty great, and it gets Psy Shock and Fan Attack in the near future. We just gained the ability to buy Reflect and Light Screen TMs, so it has good timing in that way. Even better than that is that it can learn the Thunder Wave TM that we just got as well, so it can lay down its buffs very easily. As for downsides, I think a support Pokemon like this works best in double battles, and there aren't a lot of double battles being done around Unova. 
It's not bad, but due to singles just being the common battle format, consider how good it is as a wall instead of a support Pokemon, which it's not lighting expectations super brightly at these levels, and you'll have more opportunities to catch this family later where it'll be more capable. Return of the Tanky Psychic Types, Gotharita, only found in black version. Reflect and light screen TMs are great options that you've had access to for a while now, of course. What is fantastic is that Gotharita around here are all about to evolve and are on the verge of learning Psychic. It's very tanky and is a good support Pokemon and team player between light screen and telekinesis. If you don't know, telekinesis makes the enemy immune to ground type moves but bypasses accuracy checks on them. It sounds great, but it just doesn't learn that many high power, low accuracy moves at all. It's kind of a shame since this means it's only really able to be useful in double battles or if you switch. And this is a land comprised almost entirely of singles. If you still want to get it, get it so that you can use Psychic and for its defensive capabilities. Or if you prefer, 5% of the time in Rustling Grass only is a guaranteed level 34 Gothitelle. It has full stats, but there isn't much other benefit to picking it up over Gotharita. It's lower level than any Gotharita, level up moves are identical, so it's a longer road to learning sake. Solosis! This single-celled organism is a high HP wall because, you know, it totally looks like one. Magic Guard is one of the best abilities in the game. Not many Pokemon have it, and it's just a better version of Overcoat. No contest there in which ability that you're gonna pick. Out of the box, Solosis is pretty bad. It can be caught at level 25, which will allow it to come with Psy Shock, and getting that is pretty necessary if you wanted to do any solo fighting. <laughs> Since the only other starting attack it'll have is Hidden Power, which has random typing and random base power based on the Pokemon itself, you can't guarantee that it'll have a good Hidden Power while also having the nature and ability that you want. It makes catching it at those low levels a massive crapshoot. It actually has amazing special attack and learns great special moves later on too. I should probably mention that Solosis is a Pokemon that I would consider far better in Versus than for the journey. It's a great user of the Life Orb, which gives it all of the benefit of the damage increase, but without any of the recoil damage thanks to Magic Guard. You could go and get the Life Orb right now from the Battle Subway, something you could totally do, but you'd be there for a very long time and you could probably raise something else within that amount of time. It's also known for being one of the greatest Trick Room users in single battle, but by the time you can teach it to it, there will be practically nothing left for you to do. I can't oversell how great it is because of those things, but they're practically off the table, so if you want to use it, don't use it for those reasons. And now for Revenge of the Revenge of the Tanky Psychic Types is Duosion, only in white version. A lot of the same things about Gotharita are true here. About to evolve, about to learn Psychic, but it hits a lot harder and has tons of HP in return for its sluggish speed. This is a great time to pick it up and it can definitely work for you. Uh, once again, remember that you can't teach it Trick Room for a very long time. Just like Gavatel, Reuniclus is found 5% of the time only in Rustling Grass, and again, it is level 34 and has no other outstanding benefits than higher stats at a lower level. Ducklet. Yup, just a duck. Let's go basic with this one, in line with what it is. Positives. Starts with Aerial Ace and Bubble Beam. It's decently fast and its type is pretty good. Negatives. Stats are awful until it evolves and even when it does, they're pretty mediocre other than speed. Doesn't hit as hard as other stuff, can't take many hits. Neither ability is particularly helpful, its main gimmick is Rain Dance plus Hurricane, and it'll be a very long time before it gets this. While it does learn good moves, Ice Beam is the only move that isn't normal flying or water type, and it's not accessible to you during the main quest, so it's just going to be using those moves all the time. All in all, it's not bad, but it's about as mediocre as it looks. Swana. Its main draw is using Rain to its advantage to power up its water type moves and also use Hurricane, which finally, this far into the journey, it's still on the cusp of learning it. Yeah, it still is not found at the levels in the wild where it would know its bread and butter move. Besides that, it learns normal, flying, and water moves, and then Ice Beam. It's good at what it does despite what its low stats might have you thinking, but every Swana uses the same moves. Starting us off is Vanillite. Oof, um, okay. I defended Trubbish, but maybe some silly Pokemon are as dumb as they look. First off, 
there's only three ice type families in Unova, and it just so happens they're all pure ice types. My usual spiel of pure ice type sucks, you probably would want an ice type move more than an ice type Pokemon, doesn't really apply here because you have no other choice if you want the same type attack bonus with ice. Its main starting move is Icy Wind, which is pretty pitiful considering we're not going to be doing a whole lot of double battles and that's where that move really shines. Speaking of shining, it gets mirror shot pretty quick after being caught, which is probably going to become your main attack for a long time because you're a little ways off from Ice Beam. It does have pretty great stats all around when it fully evolves, but it's such a miserable slog getting that far because it's so weak until then. If you have to use it, I suggest waiting on it unless you just have to have it right now. In battle, it mainly uses Hail and Blizzard together while activating Ice Body and then using Flash Cannon to deal with types that are weak to steal. That is pretty much all it does in battle. I suggest waiting on it because all of these moves are easily accessible once its evolution Vanillish becomes available in the wild. Vanillish! Right off the bat, I'm gonna be honest, a lot more viable than Vanillite. Evolves very quickly, it can come with Ice Beam, which is pretty helpful in a lot of upcoming fights, and we have the Flash Cannon TM for it already. Pretty much all of its best stuff is right there right now. Deerling! Ah, but anyway. With a normal Grass type, it gains a Fighting Weakness and a Ghost Immunity over what Grass types normally have. Nothing too complicated. This can be hard to fit in on a team because Grass already has a lot of weaknesses to begin with. But if you do want to use it, it is a wondrous user of the Return TM thanks to that same type attack bonus, and depending on the level it's caught at, it can already come knowing Jump Kick, which is going to be its greatest move for a good long while. Most other moves it can learn are special based, and unfortunately, it's just not that great at using them. On the plus side, however, it actually doesn't take until another Ice Age to evolve like everything else in Unova. Plus, not long after evolving, it's going to learn Horn Leech, a signature move. This is a 75 power physical grass type move that heals for 50% of the damage dealt. This is, hands down, the reason you would want to use this. Gee, it's almost like when Pokemon don't take forever to evolve, they could actually be kind of useful in spite of how obscure they are. On to greener pastures, or grayer pastures in winter, um, Sazbuck. We've seen Deerling already, and I will happily repeat myself a little bit there because it deserves the praise all over again. This is the epitome of having a ton of weaknesses and being hard to add to the team, but has a lot going for it if you can make it work. Decent attack, pretty fast, and Sap Sipper's a great ability. And the moves, oh man, the moves, they're even better than they were before. Mega Horn from Heart Scales now. Jump Kick, Horn Leech, get same type attack bonus from Return. Does not require any further discussion. Emolga. Why were you not a Pachirisu evolution? It works on so many levels. I've always thought that maybe this game was not designed to have all new Pokemon, but then at the last second, they decided to go with that route and you were planned to be one. But anyway, Emolga is a mixed attacker with its greatest strength being its speed. The electric flying type is amazing and definitely the biggest reason to consider it. Easily one of the best types ever made. Coupling that with static being a great counter to physical attackers, it's able to switch in and do a lot of damage. It's not going to be very helpful for the types of Pokemon we're going to be fighting in the upcoming areas, but it starts off with Spark, something that I've already been using, and it learns Electro Ball pretty soon, which does more damage based on the faster Emolga is than its target, complemented by its good speed. It can even learn Agility to make this even better. For once, a fast Pokemon getting Agility actually has purpose. We are getting a good TM for it very soon. You'll know it when you see it, trust me. But that's about it. Not, else, not a whole lot else going on here. Carablast! Yet another Pokemon you should only consider if you have some way to trade. It starts off as a young physical sweeper, but when traded with the Pokemon Shelmet, does a complete 180 and becomes a physical wall, packing the excellent Bug and Steel type. It's one of the absolute slowest Pokemon in existence once fully evolved, but its other stats are so ridiculously high that it doesn't even matter. Say it again with me, it takes a while to get its good moves. It's underwhelming at best as a Carablast, and while you could evolve it right away, most of its moves are unfortunately special based for a long time going forward. If you can tough it out, it will get Iron Head, will get Iron Defense, will get X Scissor, will get Swords Dance. Once it gets going, it's one of the absolute best walls out there. Though many consider it second place to a certain other wall that's coming up pretty quick. 
Next up is gonna be Fungus. Here's a Pokemon that's very solid in verses, but not so much on the journey, though it does still have some positives. Impressive bulk for one, Effect Spore can come in handy more often than you'd think, and it resists some fairly common stuff. Beyond that, it has pretty shallow moves, and this brings me to the downright painful point that it doesn't learn Spore until level 62. Spore is a 100% accurate sleep move. Does not require any further discussion as to why it's super good. Fungus has practically exclusive access to this move, and it's probably the first thing you think of when you think of Fungus, but you're not gonna be learning it. What it's probably going to end up doing instead is using Toxic, spamming Protect whenever possible to make the Toxic do more damage, using Giga Drain to heal while damaging, and then using Sludge Bomb on everything else. Preferably while holding the Black Sludge or the Leftovers. It's great at stalling with this set, but it's a shame that it falls short of what it could be, because it's just that amazing whenever its moveset comes together with Spore. Remember that the Grass-type immunity to powder moves also hasn't happened yet, so don't raise it for that reason. Also, there's next to no double or triple battles that you're going to be doing, so Rage Powder isn't useful either. This might be a Fungus, but on Route 10, you are guaranteed to level 40 Amoongus, the highest possible level that can be encountered on Route 10. Again, this is an example of a Pokemon that became great in Versus much later than it was introduced. But, should there be room for a Grass-type on your team? You could do worse. Its gimmick is outstalling opponents with Giga Drain, Toxic, Synthesis, and Protect with Leftovers of the Black Sludge. It starts out with all those moves aside from Protect as well, which you can easily teach it through TMs. Good, just not as great as many people would expect when they hear the name. The only real Pokemon you're gonna find surfing around here is Frillish! So it's basically Tentacool, and just like Tentacool, you might not expect something so common to be so helpful. We just got Surf, so it has a viable move out of the gate, and it learns lots and lots and lots of good special TMs. Almost all of them, so keep checking if it can learn new moves that you're picking up as you get them. Because you're gonna find lots of things that are compelling. Again, it's a long road before it gets to evolve, but that's not all terrible because Frillish is surprisingly bulky for what it is, and having the type that it does, it can definitely do a good job of that. If you want a traditional bulky water type, this is about the best you're gonna do. Water Absorb gives it a total of three immunities, while Cursed Body is just a great ability in general that makes the Disable status a lot more helpful than it was. Oh, and uh, if you're worried about the form differences, they are purely cosmetic, so don't worry which one you want to catch. If you're at all interested in rippling water around here is your choice between the girliest spaceship ever built or the dreaded Pringles guy! Strangely, this can be encountered as weak as level 5. Yeah, I can't imagine too many level 5 Jellicent exist in the world. Its moves are not going to differ from Frillish whatsoever, so if you get lucky enough to encounter one, you stand to lose nothing by picking it up. I learned all the good points of my Alamomola by swimming with Pokemon! I will show off its strength! Lady, I got bad news for you. Alamomola might not be a love disc evolution, but it sucks just as bad! Its stats leave a lot to be desired aside from that massive HP. And in a world where everyone does single battles, it has no chance to shine. With healer for its ability and moves like Wish, Heal Pulse, Protect, Wide Guard, Helping Hand, it was clearly built for double battles and especially triple battles. I feel like more than anything else, Alamomola was supposed to be the new Pokemon introduced to do well in triple battles, cause, you know, we had new Pokemon introduced alongside new battle systems before this, and its moveset and stats really make you feel like it's supposed to be in the center slot of a triple battle. Unfortunately, it just has no opportunity to be helpful because triple battles are so scarce. Joltik is such an underrated Pokemon in the cuteness department. Why does no one ever talk about it? Right off the bat, Electric Bug is a fascinating type with some dang good defensive compliments to each other. Not weak to ground, normal damage from flying, only weak to rock and fire. Surprisingly enough, for being four inches tall, its stacks actually aren't too unworkable and it evolves fairly fast. Well, for Unibit standards anyway. It has exclusive access to the move Electroweb, a 55 power special electric type move that always lowers the foe's speed. Definitely interesting to say the least, even if it's not that great. But the other big draw to it, other than its type, is Compound Eyes. 
The most notable uses are Charge Beam never missing, so it's likely to raise its own special attack upon hitting, and it's Thunder being 91% accurate. Its evolved form is so fast and can whip out Thunder at the start of a battle like it's nothing. And it's just so, so satisfying whenever it works. Even beyond that, it's mainly only gonna use Thunder and Signal Beam before too long, but is that really such a bad thing? Next up is Ferocid. That's how it's pronounced. I don't like it either. But onto how it works, it's the superior wall to Carablast that I've been hyping for a while. Even when unevolved, its stats are pretty decent on both fronts. Its type is good, its ability is great, and it even starts with Gyro Ball. Sure, it is one of the absolute slowest Pokemon in existence, and it takes longer to evolve than Carablast does, but its stats downright skyrocket when it hits that evolution. It will always learn Power Whip upon evolving, a super powerful physical grass type move, and it'll mainly use Curse, Gyro Ball, and Power Whip to be able to take hits and then hit hard in return. A super nice combo that we can already use on Ferocid is the Rocky Helmet together with Iron Barbs for its ability. If hit by a contact move, that alone will do one quarter of the opponent's HP just from them hitting you. It's a seriously great Pokemon to switch to, and it resists plenty of types to make sure that you can do this often. It's not just a good wall, it's a great wall. After that comes Clink. Yeah, I've been a little torn about what to say about this one. It was a little bit difficult developing an opinion of what it's like, and that's coming from somebody who's actually raised one before too. Let's talk about evolution first, as I usually do. This is only going to get fully evolved at the very end of the journey, but it's thankfully a three-stage line, meaning that it's at least somewhat workable until then. Speaking of fully evolved, well, it's a steel type with high defense, like you didn't see that one coming for the type. But it also has good speed and attack for what it is. The only thing to really avoid with this one is using special moves unless you have some method of buffing it. It has two signature moves, Gear Grind and Shift Gear. Perhaps maybe each gear is a master of each move, I don't know. But Gear Grind, it starts with. It's a two-hit guaranteed 50 power physical steel type move. While the accuracy isn't perfect, the move is great in terms of damage output. Shift Gear, it won't learn for a long time. Possibly forever. <laughs> but it raises speed by two stages and attack by one. Yeah, it's basically a better Dragon Dance. It does well to use Thunder Wave or perhaps Substitute, set up with Shift Gear, and then hit with Gear Grind. It's pretty solid at what it does. The only big disappointments that hold it back are again, you're probably not ever going to see any use for its ability, and if you're expecting it to learn Wild Charge, it can't. Okay, that was pretty long. Let's hope the Tynamo fits its length and is a little bit shorter. The immediate draw is Tynamo's type and ability combo making it one of the lucky few to naturally have no weakness. Right off the bat, this looks good if you just want a free space, don't want to really have to think about how the types mesh with the rest of your team, and just need an electric type. But speaking from experience as someone who has raised one of these before, <laughs> this might be the worst offender I've ever seen of being unusably weak until it evolves super late. Compared to everything we're fighting, its stats are laughable. And the only moves it can learn until it evolves are Tackle, Thunder Wave, Spark, and Charge Beam. That's it. Not even anything more through TMs or anything. It's bad. Like, really bad. And why did it have to be this way? It's a three-stage evolutionary Pokemon and it barely spends two seconds as an electric because it gets Crunch and Thunderbolt almost immediately, and they're the only moves worth waiting for before using that Thunderstone. Very strangely, Electric is the only member of this family who learns level up moves at all. Tynamo doesn't, Electroc doesn't, that's it. So it's at least very easy to remember the moves it's going to learn because it doesn't really get much. When it grows up, it wants to be a mixed attacker, and to be fair, it does that job pretty well. If you want Wild Charge, you should have a TM for it by the time it would become helpful to you. Basically, it's exceedingly hard to raise, and Tynamo will quickly become one of your least favorite Pokemon just for how unplayable it is. But there is good payoff if you are able to stick it out. And LGM is yet another slow psychic type. I really meant what I said about Sigilith. <laughs> this is a glass cannon. 
Due to its low speed, it needs to be used wisely to get any use out of that huge special attack stat. I don't particularly like either of its abilities, and sadly, a lot of its good moves are locked away for a long time. It's not horrible, it's just really a shame that Sigilyph, Solosis, and Gothita have all been available for so long if you want a special attacker, and it appears for the first time in the same area as Litwick. That's kind of the definition of being outclassed. <laughs> BEM is as strange as its name is to say. Very slow, but with okay bulk and high special attack. I wish you had analytic for your ability, but sadly, that just isn't an option here. It's pretty standard, learns all the good TMs that we finally picked up, and maybe you might want to throw in Trick Room for good measure. Let's hope that Litwick can do better and be the light at the end of the tunnel of all the horrible Pokemon that we've been seeing lately. All Pokemon here will be higher leveled on higher floors, so if you want to catch anything here, such as this Litwick, wait just a few extra minutes, okay? It'll be worth your time. I want to draw attention to the stats here because they are truly awful. I know that I repeat myself in saying that a lot of Pokemon take forever to evolve and that it's a slog getting there, but... Those are some of the worst stats that we have ever seen that you'll have to deal with for 10 plus levels ever. Just 10, 20 speed with 50 HP and with that many weaknesses? Are you even kidding? But uh, anyway, here comes the U-turn. Ghost and Fire are pr a pretty decent same type attack bonus combination. It learns great moves from both types and Litwick eventually evolves into one of the greatest attackers in the game. In fact, it has the highest non-legendary special attack of anything in Unova. It really stands out when so much of Unova is physical, and you're likely to find yourself needing a special attacker at this point in time because you just simply don't have one. Heck, I don't even really have one that's dedicated. A lot of mine are mixed attackers. Don't worry about needing to wait a long time until it learns Shadow Ball either, as we're gonna get the TM before we'll even need to worry about getting it through level up. I would dare say, this is outright the best ghost type in the game, and maybe even the best special attacker. Actually, we only have one new encounter! <laughs> Axu! Oh boy! Let me tell you about this little guy. This is the whole package for a physical sweeper. He's decently viable even in his current state, starting with Dragon Claw Slash and potentially Dragon Dance. Plus, it actually evolves within a few levels of being caught! Hallelujah! <laughs> I said actually again. <laughs> uh, when it evolves once, it's actually pretty viable for the levels that it's going to be fighting at. When it evolves twice, it's bar none one of the greatest physical attackers ever. 147 attack, 97 speed, Mold Breaker lets it just brute force through abilities that would cause it to do less damage, and no especially bad stats that you would care about. The best part? It learns Swords Dance immediately upon becoming fully evolved. Of course it's a great Pokemon, even calling it that might be an understatement. It might not learn Outrage until completely unreasonable levels, so I wouldn't count on getting that, but it's still greatly viable even without it. Honestly, if you want a strong dragon, I just recommend getting Axu. Don't wait on anything else. Fracture! This is a late game team edition that I can actually get behind! We've already been over this family back in Mistralton Cave, and it's one of the best physical attackers in the game. It is guaranteed to be level 40, and that combined with how many TMs we've collected throughout our many travels, you can totally put together a great moveset for this thing, and there's multiple ones out there that you might want to consider. If you regretted passing, if you regretted passing on Axu earlier, it's not too many levels away from becoming fully evolved. It'll take a bit of grinding, but that's the only real downside to getting it now. <sighs> Bad, bad, bad! <laughs> Where do I even start with you, Cub Chew? This is everything you could ever find in a bad ice type Pokemon. On the plus side, it actually evolves soon, but what good is that when everything else about it is absolutely horrible? <laughs> it's so slow, and ice is a horrible defensive type, resisting only itself and having four weaknesses. Your starting moves are Icy Wind, Fury Swipes, Brine, and Endure. Thankfully, it gets Icicle Crash upon evolving, but so many of its moves are special. I mean, sure, it can learn some alright TMs we already have, like Bulldoze, but it's so outclassed. You know it's bad when the Ice Cream Cone Pokemon outclasses you, just saying. And by a lot, I might add. Even with a Flying-type gym on the horizon, see what I did there? I think you're a lot better just not having come to. 
Ice type isn't the best to be, but hey, at least it's better than Bear Dick. Oh, it's you. How does anything suck this bad? Okay, no, I'm just kidding. It's in much better shape than Cup Chew, at least. Though that's not really saying a whole lot in the grand scheme of things, it does come knowing Icicle Crash and can learn the Waterfall HM, so thankfully it has moves that it can use. But it's still a pure Ice type with almost no speed, and even though its defenses are decent, it's not gonna be able to do much because of that, and its ability isn't really worth anything either. Cryogonal. This is a Pokemon I feel is truly unlike any other. It definitely has its flaws. It can't take physical hits for beans, and you already know I'm not a fan of pure ice types. But its ability partially makes up for these problems and makes it so it can actually switch in sometimes, having that ground immunity. It's strictly a special wall when it comes to taking hits. But when does a tank have that much speed? It starts with the respectable Aurora Beam, but it's going to learn Acid Armor and Ice Beam in the near future. Its speed is greatly appreciated because it's able to get off a buff as its first move in battle. It's one of the saving graces of Snivy that I've already been praising. And it does good damage. If you want to whip out a powerful Ice Beam before the opponent gets to move, Cryogonal is outclassed by none other in Unova. The biggest downsides to it are having the cold, cruel 1% encounter rate when it isn't winter, and the fact that its good TM moves are mostly physical, so pretty much every Cryogonal is going to wind up using the same moves due to a shallow move pool. Good at what it does, though not a lot of room for creativity. Shelmet is kind of a fun Pokemon if you're playing alongside a friend where you raise a Shelmet, your friend raises a Carablast, and then permatrade with them so you can have a piece of each other on your journeys. Um, but that doesn't actually have anything to do with how good it is. Uh, much like Carablast, it starts one way and ends up a completely different way. In this case, it is a tank that evolves into an extremely fragile sweeper. In fact, this evolves into the fastest Pokemon in Unova. Shelmet learns many moves that Excelgore does not, but none of them are anything you'd really want on a sweeper. It's stuff like Bide and Curse, so you would lose nothing by evolving right away, and its moves are far better for it in TM and in level up after it evolves. Its starting moves aren't anything to write home about, so I would suggest teaching it those Giga Drain and Focus Blast TMs we got not too long ago. Substitute is another potentially fun option with just how fragile Excelgore is. The big level up moves to look forward to after it's caught are Bug Buzz and U-Turn. After all, if you like sweepers, not only is it gonna hit great with Bug Buzz, but even if its physical attack stat's not that great, it's the fastest U-Turn you're gonna find, so it's able to get out after doing some damage and not really have to worry about being so fragile a lot of the time. And Excelgore, I'm saying it for the third time, is very fragile, I cannot overstate it enough. So it's about being sent out at the right moment, taking out nearly any foe before they can even move, and then ducking out with U-Turn if it looks unwinnable. Thanks to that playstyle, this is a solid addition to any team that has immunities to bug types weaknesses. What do we got next? Oh. Stunfisk. It's the new Bidoof! <laughs> We got a slow HP based tank here with a completely unique type, which is the single most interesting part of it. Discharge and Mud Bomb are actually pretty solid starting moves, but seriously, stick that Thunderbolt TM on it right away. It's one of the few decent Pokemon at actually using the dang thing. Out of the two abilities, you know Static is better on an especially slow tank. Limber is utterly useless unless you change its type through a move like Camouflage because it can't even be paralyzed in most circumstances anyway. Overall, Stunfisk's whole shtick is true to its name, stunning the opponent. It has a 30% chance of foes getting paralyzed if they hit it with a physical contact move, 30% chance of paralyzing with Discharge, or a 10% chance with Thunderbolt, whichever you prefer, 30% chance of lowering accuracy with Mud Bomb, and a 30% chance of lowering accuracy with Muddy Water. It may not evolve or be especially good, but it's certainly not a generic or horrible Pokemon. A tank based around the concept of making the opponent have to roll the dice every turn is at least an interesting concept if you've never tried it before and just happen to feel lucky. Honestly, even though it's not great, I think a lot of people underestimate the electric farting potato. And for more general purposes, at all times of the year, you can find Minfu. This is a Pokemon that... I don't know what to feel about, so I'll just give you the hard facts. Immediately, you can see that it takes so long to evolve that you're barely going to get any enjoyment out of using it. Once evolved, it's one of the fastest Pokemon around and has surprisingly good special attack for a fighting type, allowing it to go mixed. 
Furthering this, between having high speed, drain punch, U-turn, and having regenerator for its ability to heal one third of its max HP upon switching out, it's self-sufficient and can withstand a lot more than you would think from just looking at its defensive stats. There's a lot of good, but also a lot of bad. I think it'll come down to asking yourself if Minfu itself looks workable more than whether or not you want its evolved form. Mean Xiao! The great thing about this one is no more having to mess with Mean Fu's high evolution requirements and low stats to be able to get it. Unfortunately, it came a little bit too late. Not that it's weaker than the other things, it's just kind of a shame that there's not that many battles left to use it on. If you do want to use it, it's fast, does good damage on both fronts, and always comes doing high jump kick, so it gives you some of the best fighting type damage around. Other than that, it's a speedy U-turn user and has good type coverage. Moving on to Drudigan, this is a Pokemon that perfectly embodies the rating of pretty good, but outclassed. It's more bulky than the Axu family and still has some pretty great attack, but it's slower and it's not gonna be able to sweep through teams quite like the competition does. Though, I will give it points for being a good user of the sheer force ability and having a lot of moves to take advantage of it. Both abilities are good, but my preference and ability is this because it comes with Crunch, which triggers it in return for no chance of it lowering defense. It's also one of very few Pokemon that's a great user of Rock Climb instead of Strength or Return, due to it normally having a chance of confusing the opponent. Plus, that Rock Slide TM that we got works great on it for the exact same reason in return for no flinch chance. Basically, it's a bulkier, slower Axu with two good abilities. Dredigan is not horrible by any stretch, but its competition is just so high up there with the greats that it is outshined if only by a little bit. I'd recommend it if you want a physical dragon, but don't want to use Axu for personal reasons, or if you just like Dredigan. PLEASE DO NOT GET A GOLETTE WITH CLUTS! There's multiple bad tiers of bad abilities. There's nerfs meant to prevent overpowered Pokemon like Arkin has. And there's certain unhelpful abilities because Pokemon just are already good enough without having a good ability. But this one falls into the tier of just there to make you upset when you get one with a perfect nature and it has the wrong ability. Anyway, Golette is a slow, hard-hitting Pokemon with some tanking prowess. Ghost Ground is a diverse type having five weaknesses, but also immunities to normal fighting and electric. Then its evolution requirement is perfectly within reason and it can fight from the off. In the way of moves, this is probably its strongest, well, strength. I'd suggest taking it right away to the move reminder to learn Shadow Punch to get that boost from Iron Fist. If you wait just a measly two extra levels to evolve, it'll learn Earthquake early, making it a force to be reckoned with. Because its evolution requirements are so within reach anyway, you might as well take advantage of that. The Galette family is also interesting in that it has a, the weird distinction of being very heavy for ghost type standards. Why is this important? Well, it gets good use out of Heavy Slam. It would normally learn this upon evolving right away, but if you wait those two extra levels to use to get Earthquake, that's what Heart Scales are for. You can reteach it that way. Seriously, just wait for it so it can have both moves at level 45. It's the best way to raise it. Going back to the basics about it, it can be hard to use in some fights due to its typing, but really, if it gets to move, it will make every hit count. It's pretty great, and that's really about it. A strange oddity is that it can come holding light clay, even though it can't actually benefit from it in battle. Something tells me there was some last minute move switching going around. Ponyard. You could be so much better than you are! Why are you this way? The fact that your stats are, well, look at them, and it doesn't even evolve until level 52 is pretty much all you need to know. It doesn't even matter how good of a Pokemon it is because it's never gonna get that far. Not even bringing up the fact that it has three weaknesses that are very common and its speed is, um, shall we say, below average, but I'll make the pain of its uselessness sting all the much harder by telling you that everything else about it sounds like it would be great. Immunity to Psychic is good. Poison immunity is a decent bonus. It has great moves and Defiant is an awesome ability, but there's just so little reason to put up with Little Ponyard so that you can have a Bisharp. It's a shame too, because I like Bisharp. I just wish it evolved at a lower level. Hooray, I can finally tell you how great Bisharp is! It's right there for the taking. Good moves, good stats, potential lived up to, and all. Defiant is an excellent ability, and it has a fun type both offensively and defensively. 
If you were wishing Ponyard was just better, here it is. You don't have to wait till level 50 or so to evolve it. I wish Bufalant was a Tauros evolution. So, what is this thing? <laughs> I describe it best as raw power. It moves slow, but it can take hits and is all about doing huge damage when it gets to move. 110 attack might not seem like much, but both of its abilities make it a powerhouse. I would say that I prefer Sap Sipper under normal circumstances, but there's... Reckless might be good too. From Reckless, the recoil moves that Bufalant benefits from are Head Charge and Starting Moveset, and the soon-to-be-learned Wild Charge. I'll leave the ability choice at It's Up To You, because they're both awfully good. Other than that, Revenge is also in its starting moveset, and you can expect to learn the awesome Mega Horn very soon. 120 power with no negative effect other than accuracy is nothing to sneeze at, and its accuracy is not even that bad for how much power it has. Ac I've been spamming it lately. Thanks to it being a typical normal type when it comes to TM compatibility, it learns most of the good physical moves out there. If there's still room for a heavy hitter, especially if you need a bug type move to finish your team, Bufalant can be a fun choice. Rufflet. Why does everything in Unova have to evolve at level 89? Well, okay, 54 in this case, but it's not much better because it's not going to evolve before the end of our journey unless you're willing to grind for several hours. That's almost 20 levels higher than when it's caught, and it's like the strength of a P-Dove until then. On the plus side, its stats aren't horrible for an unevolved Pokemon, but obviously not up to code with what we've been fighting for ages now. It's a weird Pokemon with high HP, high attack, and okay speed, and what you'd expect from a flying-type physical attacker is definitely not this. A positive is that it at least starts with Aerial Ace, Slash, and Hone Claws, but that's really all I can say. It's downright boring in the way of moves otherwise, aside from the Rock Slide TM. If it were available a little bit sooner and evolved before the year 2038, then maybe it could have been a pretty decent apology for the horribly botched PETA of earlier in the game. But as it stands, it's just not useful. Next is Braviary. Hey, speaking of living up to potential finally, only in Dark Grass, this can be caught at a dang high level. It's about to learn Brave Bird, which is basically a wordplay requirement to have in your moveset. It actually comes knowing superpower as well. Basically, if you wanted Rufflet, but it just wasn't working due to its horrible timing and levels, this is the encounter for you. While Volibi's stats might not be horrible for an unevolved Pokemon, once again, it also suffers the problem that it has no chance of evolving early enough to actually do anything. It's the opposite of Rufflet in that it focuses on HP, defense, and special defense. While it might be helpful to have immunities to ground and psychic, I honestly think it's worse than Rufflet, and that's saying a lot. In addition to the problems with Rufflet, its attacking stats are so laughable even when it's fully evolved, and it's a shame because I think the type had potential to be fun and its moves aren't bad, it just can't use them very well. Mandibuzz is not horrible. It's a tanky dark flying type, and that's not so bad in concept. I just don't see something like this coming in handy too much going forward. Its attacking stats are disappointingly low, and believe it or not, its move pool is a lot more special based than physical. Unfortunately, not too exciting, but I do find it amusing that it has overcoat for an ability. Keep more! Do you even remember that this thing exists, like ever? I know, says the guy who's using Cryogonal. <laughs> so what does Heatmore do? Not a lot we haven't seen done better from other fire types. In a land dominated by Chandelure and Darmanitan, Heatmore finds itself being more comparable to Simi Seer, and even that's giving it some credit. They have almost identical stats all the way around, except that Heatmore has about half as much speed as Simi Seer. Even worse than that, Simiseer actually learns a lot more TM moves than Heatmore. You'll want to use your Fire Blast TM on this one because its fire moves just utterly stink until it's at ludicrously high levels. The only redeeming quality that I can think of is that it's kind of cute how an Anteater Pokemon learns Bug Bite, but I just find this one to be one of the most unnecessary Pokemon ever created. Even if you've heard it has good type coverage, pretty much every move that would make that true isn't available until later games on it. Seriously, you're better off just forgetting it exists, and you're probably going to do that anyway. And it gets even worse because the ant that Heatmore is supposed to be eating is better than the predator that it's supposed to be worrying about. Durant is awesome. 
Bug Steel is and always has been a very likable type that is only weak to fire, is immune to poison, and has loads of resistances. It works out nicely with how tanky it is, and much like my little special snowflake Kragonal, it's actually pretty fast and will outspeed most other walls. This is the main trait that differentiates uh, Durant from the other Bug Steel type, Escavalier, since that will never outspeed anything. Durant can outspeed a lot, avoid unnecessary damage, and not have to be on a team with Trick Room in order to do it. Both of its abilities are great, but I'd personally pick Swarm, as it's going to be able to survive hits and take advantage of it fairly often. As for moves, it starts with Iron Head and potentially X Scissor if you don't want to use your TM on it, which actually that makes no sense though, so never mind. It might as well start with X Scissor. It can also potentially start with Crunch. It's compatible with some good TM, so check it out and see what it can do if it sounds remotely interesting to you. Here we are. Dino. The time has come for the super powerful endgame dragon. And it completely and utterly totally sucks! Maybe right now you're thinking, come on, there's no way that you really believe that. The Dino family was a competitive god in its day with some of the best overall stats, great moves, it would two hit anything in the game, and has very few counters. Dino's ability eventually becomes Levitate, so it boasts two immunities on its own. It learns so many great moves, especially from TMs. It can have astounding type coverage. It's a monster in battle, and we've had access to the Life Orb for ages now to make its damage output even more aggressive. So how in any way could it ever suck? It won't fully evolve until level 64. This is the highest requirement of any Pokemon, even to this day, to fully evolve. And we're right in the middle of catching up to N at the Pokemon League. By the time it's at a high enough level, if it ever reaches that point, you'll have nothing left to explore or do except playing matches and verses or grinding up points in the battle subway. I'd like to deviate from the formula a little bit to show Zwilus' stats and what it's like. That's gonna be what you're lugging around for dozens of hours for almost no payoff if you didn't intend on playing in Versus. I've raised one of these myself. I gave it the experience share from the moment I caught it, never equipped it, and as soon as it was within range to evolve, I used every rare candy I picked up across the entire travels to top it off and get it evolved as soon as humanly possible. By the time I did so, I was done with the post game except for five battles. This is probably the worst example of an overwhelming superpower and competitive, but something I would never recommend to my worst enemy for anything else. Larvesta. The best way I can put this is, don't use it. <laughs> Doesn't require any further review. It's only level one. No string shot in Ember. Won't evolve for 58 more levels. I never thought I'd see the day when I wished a baby Pokemon evolved through happiness instead of by a fixed level, but Larvesta found a way to make it happen. If you want to use this family, there is a much better opportunity at another time. Well, that answered that. Volcarona is overpowered! With ruthlessly strong stats for sweeping, access to the wondrous Quiver Dance that's learned by few Pokemon, it is a cruel force that manages to work with a type that would otherwise be considered a crippling weakness. Its move pool works very well. The dual same type attack bonus of Bug and Fire deals with many, many types. And if it can set up, it's capable of sweeping through entire teams with no trouble. It has a signature move. Fiery Dance is an 80 power special fire type move that has a 50% chance of buffing the user's special attack upon doing damage. I'd say, damn Volcarona, you're scary, but it doesn't even need that move to do it. Unfortunately, Fiery Dance is only learned at level 100. On top of that, Larvesta also learns Flare Blitz at level 100, and this is the only time this ever happened for a non-legendary Pokemon that it learned anything at level 100. I don't know why they would do that, but it's more or less off limits to you, but it's not like it's even a big deal with how powerful it is otherwise. 
The only bad thing about Volcarona isn't even really a problem unless we're talking about Versus, and that's Stealth Rock. Volcarona's often forced to come out early in a battle because of the threat of that always looming overhead, and if it doesn't get a chance to do a lot near the beginning, it likely isn't going to get a second chance to set up. But who cares? It's level 70, we're not even strictly talking about Versus, and it's objectively one of the best special attackers there is. The note that I want to end on is that the most truly great thing about Volcarona, besides everything else, is that if you're annoyed by all these level 60-something trainers coming out of your ears and making every fight take forever, Volcarona just kinda deals with them all and isn't even that hard to catch either. If you add this to your team, there's very few fights that you'll have any trouble with after it sets up so much as one Quiver Dance. I feel like calling this a great addition to any team is underselling it. With impressive bulk, both from stats and its typing, Kobalion is hard to bring down. It has a very clear identity in being faster than most other walls, being quite capable in using mixed attacking movesets, and being able to switch in not only due to its type, but also that ability of Justify that makes it potent out of the gate if a dark move is baited successfully by another team member in addition to it quad resisting it. This is one of only three obtainable Pokemon to have Justified, and speaking of, it's also one of only three obtainable Pokemon to have the move Sacred Sword. This is a 90 power physical fighting type move that ignores the target stat changes. Though many would argue that close combat is a better move for it in Versus, it will be what you are using because it doesn't learn close combat at a reasonable level. Other than that, the only real red flag on it is low special defense, but even then, it's capable of learning both Combine and Swords Dance, further bolstering the fact that Cobalion can do just about anything. Whatever you're into, buddy. Completing the Swords of Justice, it's Terrakian! It occurs to me that this trio is the exact same three types that I said the Timber family should have been, but regardless of that, this Pokemon is pure offense. Its type is great offensively, terrible defensively, and its stats matches perfectly by just going all in on attack and not even trying to be a tank like the other two. Much like his brethren, it starts with Sacred Sword. Complementing that, its move of its type is Rock Slide, giving it great moves out of the gate. Other than maybe Swords Dance, don't count on it learning many more moves by a level up within reason. But it's so great as it is, and thankfully has no shortage of powerful TM moves that you can teach it already. Do you need much else? Terrakian is fine as it is. Except for its goofy looking little dress shoes. I'm not that big of a fan of those. Second Sacred Sword Wielder, Verizian, outspeeds many, many Pokemon. It has a type that stands out that you won't find much of anywhere else, and the combination of grass and fighting is excellent for attacking. Much like Kabalian, it's able to take hits decently well, can go mixed, and has access to both Calm Mind and Swords Dance to make it even better at doing so. Between the speed, offensively viable type, decent bulk, and great moves, again, the only real negative thing is that you won't realistically see close combat on it at any decent level. Attempt number two! Tornadus is the world's first natural pure flying type! That time you got here. This is the black version counterpart to Thunderous having completely identical stats. While its type isn't as spectacular as electric flying, the real draw that sets it apart is moves. They are good counterparts in this way of do you want a better type or do you want better moves? It starts with extra sensory, which is great for type coverage because we don't have a psychic TM. It's about to learn Air Slash, which is an easy choice for it when it has such high speed and can score frequent flinches on it if it doesn't KO. 
Tornadus is also unusual in being one of only a few Unovan Pokemon to learn acrobatics, and you know how good that is, so that's another good choice for it. Its bread and butter in competitive would be Rain Dance and Hurricane to completely bypass accuracy checks with that 120 power flying type, but it's not going to get that until level 67, so I wouldn't factor that into your decision to use it. Again, learns no other moves that benefit from Rain Dance, so maybe not such a huge letdown that you can't use that. I guess you could call me a Storm Chaser! It appeared for the pun, yes! Puns are the source of my luck! It explains so much about me, really. Thunderous is a force to be reckoned with. The simply phenomenal electric flying type, excellent attacking stats, and some of the best speed out there combines to make it a great Pokemon. It has Prankster for its ability, and it can get some priority with great moves like Thunder Wave and even Swagger. On their own, those are all powerful traits, but in attacking moves, it happens to be compatible with a Thunderbolt TM we already have, and Rain Dance Thunder is also a powerful combination that you might want to consider for it. But be warned that Thunderous learns no other moves that take advantage of rain, so it's generally best to do that on teams that already benefit from rain. Volt Switch is also an excellent option with that blistering speed. It gets some great moves too, and not just in terms of damage. With Prankster, it can pull off a substitute with priority, and if you call your opponent doing a status move, you can make yourself immune to it. But the big catch with using Thunderous is that it basically gets no use out of that flying type same type attack bonus. The only flying type moves it can even learn are Fly and Sky Drop. Can you say disappointing? I certainly hope you wouldn't describe Thunderous like that, because when your defensive typing ability moves and stats are so golden, who cares? Thunderous is only found in white version. The counterpart to Zekrom. The two dragons are in a class of their own. Reshiram's special attack is through the roof. None of its stats are outright bad, and its types are not commonly resisted, making it a dangerous foe to anyone. Its signature move is Fusion Flare, a fire-type counterpart to Zekrom's Fusion Bolt. If the two moves are used against one another at the same time, the attack that connects second will be powered up to 200 power, a rarely seen phenomenon. While Zekrom might have the better type, Reshiram's moves mo boast a much greater variety. Its strength? Unmatched to all but Zekrom. Zekrom is in a class of its own, boasting the highest attack in all of Unova, a remarkable type combination, no especially bad stat, and damage so great that even foes who resist it will still take a beating. Its signature move is Fusion Bolt, 100 power, 100 accuracy, physical, electric type damage. One of the most reliable moves out there. Thanks to its ability, Lightning Rod and Motor Drive are a complete non-issue for this move, and ground types are the only thing it actually needs to worry about switching into it. Probably the only weak thing about Zekrom is that it doesn't learn very much variety in moves, but really, it's just such a downright powerhouse, do you really need anything more? Reshiram and Zekrom do not just have Fusion Bolt and Fusion Flare as signature moves. I never did go back and talk about them, and I meant to, it's just that I didn't discuss them when we went over them in bios, as it wasn't important to anything that was going on in the moment, as their other two signature moves, Blue Flare and Bolt Strike, are learned at level 100. These are 130 power, 85 accurate special moves of their types that have a 20% chance of either burning or paralyzing the target. They're powerful, and very nice moves if you can get them up to that level. Very strong moves, and if you swear that you've seen these on Reshiram and Zekrom anyway, even though you never raised them up to level 100, that's because they have done countless distributions over the years where they distributed them already knowing those moves. In fact, it's so common that I'm willing to bet that's how most people know about them. Small Weathered Shrine. Tornadus and Thunderous are struggling inside their Pokeballs!
Because that sound effect was totally transcribable as Karamakukuk. <laughs> the master of the forces of nature! For, I mean, uh, Landorus! While it might look like a cheap recolor of Tornadus, who is a cheap recolor of Thunderous, it's quite worthy of being their superior. It sports a remarkable ability of Sand Force that powers up its Earthquake, Stone Edge, and Rock Slide. Has two awesome immunities to both Ground and Electric, lofty sweeping stats, access to Swords Dance, and just barely outspeeding a lot of already fast Pokemon. Even beyond that, it's set apart from Tornadus and Thunderous just in the sheer variety of moves it can use, including some weird moves that you might not even expect right away. We've got U-Turn, Grass Knot, Psychic, Rock Polish, and heck, even Outrage here. Its special attack should not be discounted either when taking those into account, since it's great with that too. Its only real faults are its average bulk and the fact that hard-hitting water and ice types are common on most any team and they'll be able to counter it pretty well. Unova is in good hands with this guy watching over it. The forgotten Dow Dragon of Absence. Qrem, ever since splitting into Reshiram and Zekrom. This empty shell can be seen as a counter to the other two dragons. Its unique ice dragon type gives it two very good offenses to gain damage bonuses from. Plus, it even allows it to be a dragon that can wholly benefit from hail and dish out dangerous blizzards. Its mixed attacking prowess is very solid and is a middle ground between the two dragons its body spawns. Even further setting it apart is that even though Ice brings down the defensive capabilities a little bit, its stats are easily viable to wall and the Dragon type allows it to switch in on a lot more than other Ice types can claim. I wouldn't say that there's anything particularly bad about it. Heck, it's even faster than it looks. I mean, just look at how it's trying to move around right there. When I think built for speed, about the last thing that I would ever think of is bending over so far that my head's dragging on the ground. I'm just gonna put this as bluntly as I can. What is the obsession with Caldeo's butt? I'm not making things up here. I am not drawing parallels that aren't there. Look at its official artwork. Look at more of its official artwork. Heck, it even shoots water out of its ass in the dang anime. Okay, I know it's a hind kick, but it, it looks like it's shooting water out of its butt, okay? At least that's what I thought. And I know that I'm not alone on this thought, because not only is it such a recurring pattern in so many official works, and I know that you could say that it's that Keldeo is doing hind kicks because it's kind of like a donkey and all that, and they tend to do hind kicks, but you can't tell me that you didn't look at that extra line of detail that they didn't need to draw on its leg and tell me that you didn't immediately think that was a butthole. I know that that's been the case among any friends that I've brought this up to, because I've talked with many people about this over the years because of just how much it bothers me, and I'll just be like, you know, is it me or does Keldeo's official artwork have a butt? And that's as far as I get before they're like, oh my god, you understand me! <laughs> it's such a weird, consistent choice in any sort of official artwork depicting Keldeo. I know that there's official artwork where he's not like that, but it happens a lot more often than it doesn't. Let's move on and actually talk about how Keldeo is as a Pokemon. With good speed and great special attack combined with two good attacking types, Keldeo is one of the best special attackers you will find. There's a choice between Surf and Hydra Pump that you'll probably have to make, in that both are great water moves for it, but both have different advantages and disadvantages, where Hydra Pump has just enough accuracy to justify that higher power. For fighting type moves, here's where it gets fun. Keldeo is the only Pokemon ever that learns Secret Sword. This is an 85 power special fighting type move that calculates damage based on the opponent's physical defense. It works a lot like the move Psyshock does. With this by its side, there's almost nothing that its huge special attack can't do. It's an adorable little sweeper with these tools at its disposal and calm mind. What more could you want? 
Well, okay, it is a little bit disappointing that it's a water type special attacker that doesn't learn a single ice move. You'll have to rely on hidden power if you want anything remotely strong for ice type, but look at that face. And not the butt. Also, it was kind of a cute thing. With Keldeo being the youngest of the Swords of Justice, it takes longer to learn Sacred Sword than the others by leveling up. It's a cute little detail that I kind of enjoy. We use Relic Song, which she actually does whistle the tune that we just heard. And then, Meloetta is unpredictability given form. Its added normal type complements its psychic type well to set it apart. It learns Calm Mind and many special attacks with secondary effects, which just so happen to get boosted by its ability of Serene Grace. It mainly functions as an actually kind of fast special wall that only really needs to watch out for dark type moves from Pokemon that would outspeed it. However, Meloetta has even more unpredictability on its side. Relic Song is a 75 power special normal type move and because of Serene Grace, happens to have a 20% chance of putting the opponent to sleep while also doing damage. When this move hits, Meloetta transforms into its pirouette form. This is fighting normal type and pumps Meloetta's stats into speed and attack instead, turning it into a physical sweeper in the middle of a battle. It can be ridiculously fun switching back and forth between forms mid-combat to have a one-man army and just mess with the opponent, always having whatever it is they don't want to see. In the vein of it being hard to predict, this means Meloetta can run multiple physical sets, multiple special sets, or just a mixture of both. Really, the only disappointing thing, other than its speed potentially being low sometimes, is that it can't learn Swords Dance for the pirouette form. While Meloetta doesn't have the biggest raw power ever, it can pack so many tools in battle, and you're left with a Pokemon that's just fun to use and downright unpredictable. I've lost everything. I forgot my duty as a scientist is to make the world happy. So, this must be what I get for trying to make a Pokemon into a tool for fighting. I'm going to wash my hands of this Genesect matter. I don't need this anymore. I will give it to you. The Douse Drive! The item I gave you was made for Genesect. When it holds an item like this, it changes the type of the move called Technoblast, so it always can always have an advantage. There was another one in my other pocket. Holding out on us, Chill Drive! In black version, he would give you something else. He would give you the Shock Drive and I think the Burn Drive were the name of those two items. So depending on the version, you can get separate ones. And you know what that means. We have access to Genesect's full potential. Team Plasma's ultimate creation and the final Pokemon in the Univadex. With the excellent defensive typing of Bug Steel, good speed, and strong offensive stats, this is a sweeper that can just keep the pressure going. The ability download is surprisingly good in its usage by Genesect 2 when it's a mixed attacker. It can reliably benefit from either a physical attack or a special attack boost. In fact, because of its ability activating as soon as it's sent out, it essentially has at least a 189 base stat in whatever it gets the boost in as soon as it's sent out into battle. Easily, the biggest and best tool it has at its disposal is U-Turn. With its speed, attack, and potential download boost, plus bug giving it same type attack bonus, this hits for so dang much, and it takes a huge bite out of anything that you'd want to switch against whenever Genesect might be scared into switching out of battle. Even if your foe resists it, it's going to hit for a lot. Otherwise, it's a strong user of Iron Head. Heck, even if Genesect does get weak, it's disposable because it learns Explosion and is one of the better users of it out there. As we just heard, Genesect has a signature move called Technoblast, an 85 power, 100 accurate special move that can be normal type, fire type, ice type, water type, or electric type, depending on Genesect's held drive. This sounds cool and all, but Technoblast is weaker than Flamethrower, Ice Beam, and Thunderbolt, which it learns anyway. Plus, unlike a certain other Pokemon that does the same thing with their signature move, Genesect can never get the same type attack bonus from any of these attacks. So when it comes down to it, only the Douse Drive is worth anything because Genesect doesn't learn any other water type moves. And when it uses up its held item slot as well as one of its move slots just to have another move type in its move set, 
You have to ask yourself if it's worth all that trouble just to give Genesect a water move. I really don't think it is, and with the held item slot freed up, you can instead use that slot for a choice item or a life orb, which is how it performs best. With its U-turn hitting so much faster and it's switching out all the time, being locked into a move with a choice item is not such a big deal either. Unimpressive as a signature move might be, it's still a ruthlessly strong Pokemon in every other aspect. I always wondered where all those trainers in Gold and Silver got their level 50 Metapods from. <laughs> but anyway, it knows one move. Harden. Yeah, even at this level. It evolves in one level, which means having to use a heart scale to teach it anything. This family is only found in white version. You can trade the headache of spending a lot of time to reteach moves for the headache of finding a 5% fully evolved Butterfree and Rustling Grass, if that sounds less headachey to you. Believe it or not, I think Butterfree is pretty cool now. I fully admit that it has its flaws, specifically seven of them, and they're called HP, Attack, Defense, Special Attack, Defense, Speed, and Type. But it has two main strategies that set it apart from everything else, and they're pretty fun to use. First off, it's one of very, very few Pokemon to have Quiver Dance, which is already a massive plus. Don't need to say it any further than that. It can put this buff power to good use, and some might like that. But where it really shines would be through Compound Eyes, making its Sleep Powder almost 100% accurate. Butterfree is fast for 100% sleep standards, and the fact that it's able to buff with Quiver Dance while the enemy sleeps, don't lie. Despite its flaws, that sounds pretty fun. Harden. Only found in black version, Beedrill is awful! <laughs> it learns almost no attacking moves it can make good use of, has a bad type for what its stats are, and is so outclassed and frail. The only things available to it that are remotely useful are Swords Dance, x Scissor, and Brick Break. For a good same type attack bonus move, Poison Jab isn't even all that worth it, because in a lot of cases, Bug is just factually better than Poison as an attacking type. It's bad, I'll only consider it if you like Beedrill and want a personal challenge. Raticate. I know what you're thinking, but despite the weak preconception I'm sure you have, Raticate actually has a few solid things going for it this time around. Not amazing, but halfway decent when Guts is going. Unfortunately, it has to get the Flame Orb or Toxic Orb from the Battle Subway to make that happen, so that is a bit of a barrier to using it. If you can, then, Using Return with Raticate hits for a lot of damage when it's combined with these tactics thanks to the same type attack bonus. Super Fang is a great move that not many Pokemon learn, and it even has Sucker Punch and Crunch naturally. Surprisingly, it also is compatible with the TMs for U-Turn and Wild Charge, meaning that it has actual type coverage for once in its little life. The biggest negative that I can think of is that it can't use many compatible special attacks for beans. But if you need a physical attacker and Raticate sounds fun and you've never tried it before, honestly, you could do a lot worse. It's easy to find at a high level, and it's miles above the mediocre user of nothing but normal and dark type moves that it used to be. Not horrible. Fero! It's a fast, physical, normal bird Pokemon. Probably the only outstanding thing worth saying is that now it learns Drill Run. It's just kind of normal. Kind of flying, expected, and outclassed especially this far in, though not terrible. We're starting off with Sand Slash. Yeah, it has Earthquake. Yeah, it's got Swords Dance. Yeah, it's got pretty good attack and defense. It just, it doesn't do a lot we haven't already seen from better Pokemon. It's all right, and I could see how some people might think it's underrated. Heck, it can learn a few interesting TMs like X Scissor that you might not find in every ground type, but it just doesn't stand out and isn't terribly exciting outside of that compared to everything else with a ground type that we've seen up to this point. I hate to say it because I want Sand Slash to be better than it is. It's cool looking. Clefairy. So it's not the sweet little bringer of death in double battles that you might know it for being. It's very versatile, able to perform well in both singles and doubles depending on what moves it's taught, learns tons of good moves for both offense and support, has virtually all of its level up moves available through heart scales right away, and is just, in general, pretty good because of all that. If you want, Clefable can be found rarely in Rustling Grass, but you're better off just getting it as a Clefairy because Clefable doesn't learn any moves leveling up, and it's not even that much higher level than Clefairy when it's encountered. Vulpix! If you want to use it, Flash Fire is the ability that it's stuck with, giving it a fire immunity, and 
actually, I can say that is somewhat positive because fire already resists more types than you might expect, so it has a fair number of things that it can switch into, and that just makes it a little better. However, of course, with the exception of how darn cute it is, because I will concede that Vulpix is of course one of the cutest Pokemon ever made, it's a speedy tank, and we all know how I feel about that. All in all, it has very strange stat distribution and learns very few attacking moves. Every Ninetales uses the same moves. Something Fire type, Energy Ball, and then either Psy Shock or Extra Sensory for Psychic type. It's just a weird Pokemon and not necessarily in a good way. Evolution, Dark Grass, low level. Jigglypuff! This one works in pretty expected ways. Lots of moves, lots of HP, downright puny, and everything else. Generally, it performs best doing support things, like using that huge HP to use Wish for its teammates. I hate to be short on such a classic, but there just isn't much more to it other than that. Wigglytuff is found in Dark Grass, but I don't have anything more to add, so I'll just say that Wigglytuff's animated sprite is funny and bad. Right off the bat, we have Golbat! We have a type with some pretty good defenses that make it more than just a speedy Pokemon, but dang, it's a pretty speedy Pokemon. Of course, needing happiness to evolve is a bit of a turnoff for most, but it should be pretty easy to reach with your bike and your Sooth Bell. This is notable for being one of the few Pokemon to learn acrobatics, and it would be a pun crime if it didn't learn that. That's good, sure. But what's really just the best about it and getting to use that speed is effects like U-Turn and Taunt. Yet another common poison type that I think is better than you think it is. And hey, look who it is in the rustling grass. Crobat can be encountered at level 50, but shamefully, the Golbat in Dark Grass are much higher level. Paris in white only. It's terrible. One of the weakest Pokemon ever. Horribly slow, absurdly weak type for how slow and fragile it already is, and the only outstanding thing about it is that it's one of very few Pokemon and no spore, but Amoongus is the actually good spore user, and that's the end of that. Moving on is Venomoth. And we have another Pokemon that's not great, but also not horrible. It's a modest special attacker. See what I did there? It has access to some pretty decent moves like Signal Beam, Energy Ball, and Psychic. Tinted Lens is easily the better of its two abilities, causing moves resisted by the opponent to do double damage, offsetting a normal resistance. But the main attraction for why Venomoth would be good is Quiver Dance, one of the best buffing moves ever. It raises speed, special attack, and special defense at the same time, and Venomoth is one of very few Pokemon that's even able to learn it. But I said it would be good because it learns it so late. Plus, if you want to use Quiver Dance, there is a better option. A better option that we'll be meeting very soon. A better option that is borderline overpowered. Venomoth is not terrible, but it's very, very outclassed. Golda, a Pokemon with passable stats, but it's mainly a special attacker. Not many Pokemon can negate weather, so that's probably the single most interesting part of it. Honestly, it's pretty generic, it's a pretty outclassed water type, and when you remove negating weather from the decision, it uses Calm Mind, it uses Surf, and it uses Ice moves, eventually gaining access to Psychic. It's probably most interesting if you were to use it on a Sun Team that could use a water type that functions on it somehow. Mankey! is our Swarm Encounter for Route 15. It evolves in one level into Primeape, an unusually speedy fighting type. Fitting of its ragey portrayal, it hits pretty well, and is pretty much done if it gets hit at all. I wish I could say Anger Point was an ability worth your time because it is really fun when it actually works, but it's so squishy that it'll probably be knocked out before it would get half a chance to see any benefit from it. Otherwise, it uses physical moves and is a pretty fast U-Turner when it sees an unwinnable fight. Poliwag! It's capable of being fully evolved at any level it's caught at. Gotta love those efficient dex fillers. The whole Poliwag family can have either Damp or Water Absorb for its ability, with Water Absorb easily being the more useful of the two and making it easier to switch into. Found rarely while fishing is Poliwhirl. It's found at all the same levels as Poliwag, so not much different here. The main draw of this family is that they're some of the very few Pokemon that can learn Belly Drum. Seems like we're talking about a lot of rare moves lately. This costs half of the user's HP to max out the attack stat. We're talking plus six. A very dangerous move for both sides and can swing a battle in one's favor when used in just the right moment. It can only learn this attack as a Poliwag or a Poliwhirl, so make sure you have it before choosing to evolve. 
It also gets Hydro Pump in this stage if that interests you. I haven't said much about the Pokemon itself yet because this is a split evolution line and how good it is really relies on what you evolve it into. Starting with the classic, we got Poliwrath, a water fighting type and a bit of a jack of all trades in terms of stats. The type combination's interesting if nothing else, pretty good for offense and an abundance of resistances. Unfortunately, Poliwrath's usual draw of Hypnosis Focus Punch or Substitute Focus Punch just simply isn't available because there's no Focus Punch TM in Unova. It's not able to learn it unless transferred from an earlier game. Instead, it winds up using Waterfall and is one of few Pokemon to have Circle Throw, a 60 power fighting type move with low priority that forcibly switches out the opponent. Again, lots and lots of rare moves lately. Circle Throw is great when used together with Substitute, but it's certainly no Focus Punch. Oh, and uh, Poliwrath is rarely found in the wild when fishing in rippling water if you um, don't have the tools to evolve it, but I would not recommend hunting it. Your alternate choice is Politoed, a pure water type. Much like Poliwrath, its popular use isn't available, so don't go expecting it to have Drizzle for its ability. A lot of running trends in this family, actually. First rare moves, and then don't expect it to do the thing it's known for. Besides that, it's more of a special counterpart to Poliwrath, and it does, surprisingly enough, learn a fair number of TMs to support this for type coverage. Not useless, but kind of a shame that it doesn't live up to what a monster it could have been and what it's known for present day. Politoed and its evolution item are both not obtainable here, but it is found in the wild elsewhere and we will be getting a King's Rock soon enough. So I thought I'd go over it now. Starting off the challenge is Graveler. Right away, must be traded to evolve. If you don't like the stats you see here, which why would you, then it's not worth your time. If you can get it to evolve, its physical stats are very solid. See what it did there? Has a good attacking type with many exploitable weaknesses, a trait very common among its kin. Sturdy is a great ability, of course, and you can definitely draw parallels to the Gigalith family. There isn't a whole lot to say here that isn't immediately obvious. Basically, it's a Gigalith with a ground type to make up for having less attack. Rapidash is a Unovan fire type that's outclassed, or UFO for short. Sure. <laughs> There's a lot to love and talk about for hours when it comes to Rapidash, but Unova is already so chock full of the best fire types around. Flash Fire is a great ability that makes it able to switch in more often than what a pure fire type could normally do. You got Megahorn, Flare Blitz, and Wild Charge. Not much else, but do you really need much else? I'm sure trainers would prefer a dual type to go with the fire, but Rapidash is at least mildly respectable, and certainly better than what we just came off of. Next up comes Slowpoke. How fitting that this one came so much later than the other ones. <laughs> we got a split evolution that can go one of two ways right away. So screw talking about this poor slob. Let's move on to the real things you want to hear about. Slowbro is a good tank with its biggest flaw being it's larger than average number of type weaknesses. It sets up with Calm Mind, does good damage with both of its main types, can wall an opponent even better if it's able to get the burn chance with Scald, and it's a pretty nice Pokemon between all those things. My least favorite trait of it are its abilities, which used to be known as traits, so that's kind of redundant, but neither is very helpful. In spite of that, I feel like this is one of the most consistently good Pokemon that just kind of goes unnoticed by most people. It's pretty nice. Slowking is the same Pokemon, but the defense and special defense are swapped, and it learns a few different moves that Slowbro does not, and vice versa. The biggest difference is that it's more aggressive. That sounds so awkward when you look at its little face. <laughs> but what I mean is that there's the option for Nasty Plot instead of Calm Mind that Slowbro doesn't get to have. Really, both options are alright. Up to what you want. Farfetch'd has no stat over 65, never evolves, and is one of the objectively worst Pokemon of all time. Surprisingly, I gotta hand it to Farfetch'd in that it actually has good moves. It has Swords Dance, Brave Bird, and even Night Slash now. I would give it points for knowing False Swipe, but we've had a TM from Juniper for that for how long, and you'd be very hard pressed to not qualify for getting that, so not exactly earning points for originality there. It is one of the very few Pokemon that can learn acrobatics, and I have praised Pokemon for this in the past, but really, it's bad. Everything else is better at using acrobatics. I'd wager that my Cryogonal uses acrobatics and does more damage. It has a unique gimmick in that the stick item will raise its critical ratio by two stages, but again, I don't really think that's going to save it. Doduo, a fast, hard-hitting, normal flying type, and that's about it. Not worthless, but just very basic yet again. If you want something to use Return well, use Drill Pack and 
Use Pursuit, well, it'll serve that purpose, but won't be doing much of anything else. I wish it had Brave Bird through means other than breathing. Seal. This is not a horrible Pokemon, but it's about as outclassed as it is forgettable. Its stats are just very average, and it isn't very good defensively. Even if water and ice are a good attacking combination, and it certainly has the moves that you'd want for that, as well as unusually learning Signal Beam, it's just all done better by something else. Hydration is about the only thing compelling about it, but even that isn't much when you probably don't have a weather team. If you're interested or you just have to have Seal because you like it, Dugong can be found rarely in rippling water and potentially at high levels, like any other evolved form of any of these surfing Pokemon. Keep that in mind. The Shelter family is here, and yes, I said family. Found under very rare circumstances in rippling water is Cloyster and... Ouch! Okay, Cloyster is good again, but sadly it requires breeding to do the things that make it so good. Basically it functions as a wall, but it can give that up by using Shell Smash, and then use Skill Link with Icicle Spear and Rock Blast to make those moves always hit five times. It's a wondrous Pokemon, and it's great to see Cloyster be so great again, but if it's not being bred for those exact moves, it just falls short of the awesome potential that it now has at its disposal. Onyx, which itself is pretty fast for a rock type, certainly a lot faster than it would seem like at first glance. We already have the metal coat to evolve it, and upon doing so, it drops that speed in rock type to gain a steel typing, which... I think is personally a pretty big net gain. It boasts a ton of resistances, takes very little physical damage from anything, and does a pretty decent job hitting back as well. Speaking of hitting back, in the way of, I gotta say it, unexpected moves, this is going to be the first and probably last time I ever recommend the Dragon Tail TM for anything, because on something this slow and tanky and defensive type-wise, it's pretty nice to have to just mess with your opponent and make them switch out whenever they have what you don't want to see. It's pretty alright and can be fun to use. Krabby has great physical strength and defense, but is held back by not learning many moves. It does have X Scissor for a little bit of type coverage, but will usually wind up using Crab Hammer instead. To its credit, barely any Pokemon learn Crab Hammer, and it's basically a stronger waterfall with a higher critical hit chance instead of a flinch. This is a Pokemon that would benefit a lot from agility due to its attack and below average speed, but sadly it only gets that by breeding with Archaeops, something that no one wants to do. As per usual, the Evolve Form Kingler can be obtained rarely by fishing in rippling water, but it would take a bit too long for my liking. If you get lucky though, you know what it does. Execute! It's a glass cannon! Walking on eggshells much? It's slow with a ton of weaknesses making it a bit hard to get use out of its big special attack. Definitely works best on Sun Teams more than anything else because of its ability. Other than that, it can have Psychic when caught, but it's a bit disappointing in that it just doesn't learn a very wide variety of moves. Maybe you like Execute a lot and you just want to go for it anyway. It is far from the worst Pokemon that you could add to your team at this point in time. But just be warned that it might be hard to slot into the team that you've already constructed. Marowak would be just an alright Pokemon meant for taking hits and then hitting back decently hard, but oh. It didn't settle for that. We have the natural choice for an item on Marowak, the Thick Club. That thing doubles its attack and allows it to hit for ludicrously high damage. Another great thing to add is that Marowak's signature move, Bone Meringue, is a 50 power, 90 accurate, physical ground type move that always hits twice. But why would you ever want this over Earthquake when Earthquake is one hit that does 100 power? because it gets around all kinds of little technicalities like Sturdy, and with effectively 160 attack backing it up with that item, it'll often do enough damage to one shot, or two shot, but it gets around Sturdy in one turn. And because it likes using unexpected moves so much, it can also use that rock head to use double edge instead of return. One of very few Pokemon where I would outright recommend that as the natural choice. It is an overwhelming force, but be mindful of that poor speed and the common weaknesses, of course. If used when not vulnerable to those shortcomings, it is likely to slay its way through any target. Some Pokemon have all the luck in being able to live in a place with music this good. Tyro is your swarm encounter for Route 10. It evolves at level 20, and its evolution is decided by what its stats are. 
Its moves are incredibly limited as Tyrogue, since its three evolutions all have radically different playstyles and they don't want to give you all of those moves up front. Hitmonlee is the fastest and most attack oriented, and as you would expect, it uses some fancy footwork moves. One thing that's immediately interesting is that Hitmonlee learns Blaze Kick naturally. Without TMs, not only does it get that, but a bunch of great fighting type moves. Hitmonchan is a bit slower and more defensive, and has that awesome Iron Fist ability to increase the power of what it's known for doing best. Wearing dresses, right? No. Uh, yes, it gets the elemental punches and focus punch. What more could you want? Hitmontop is balanced, because otherwise it would fall over. Durr. It learns a lot of fighting moves, some punching moves, and some kicking moves. It's pretty expected as a hybrid between the two should be. Hitmontop has the distinction of learning counter without needing to breed, learning rapid spin to get rid of entry hazards like Stealth Rock, and has the signature move of Triple Kick, which works mildly interestingly. It's a three hit move that has 90% accuracy and 10 power, but the power increases by 10 for each successive hit that turn, for a total of effectively 60 power. It does get the boost from Technician, which makes that a little bit nicer as every single hit is buffed by it. However, I would greatly prefer to just go with Intimidate and give it close combat. I do love this family a lot, it's one of my all-time favorites in fact, but it just comes in so late I'm not sure that I would even raise a baby Pokemon for any purpose now. Second is Lickitung. It evolves with Rollout, which translates to evolves in one level. It's bulky, but is not strictly a wall either. It's a great user of Body Slam or Return, and you can't go wrong with either of them when it also gets Swords Dance. It also has some fun toys like Power Whip being a strong move that isn't learned by many Pokemon, as well as having a rare same type attack bonus explosion. In even more surprising moves, well, okay, maybe not more surprising, but it actually learns Dragon Tail, so it makes for a decent physical attacker with all right coverage, but it also learns its fair share of special moves too, as you would expect from the normal type lineage. It can do a lot of different things, so try it out, see what you can scrounge up. It is as fun as it looks. Tangela! This little bundle of vines will one day take off its shoes and become a physical wall with very good stats. Right away, it'll have access to ancient power so that it can evolve, but both forms can be found. Tangrowth is a physical wall with very good stats. It's what you'd expect. It can take hits, use sleep powder, and recover HP in many various ways. It also learns Power Whip, a 120 power physical grass type move with 85% accuracy that barely anything learns at all, so it's nice to see it here. It's definitely strong in many ways and even works with a lot of good physical TM moves. Seriously, if you don't know the kinds of moves that Tangrowth can learn, try out your TMs on it. It'll surprise you. The flaws it has are basically just what you already see being pure grass type and having a lot of weaknesses combined with being slow and unable to take special damage. It does its job well and is very fun. And perhaps if Amoongus didn't seem fun to you due to it packing less firepower, maybe you do want to trade off Spore and give Tangrowth a spin. Whoo mama, before Kangaskhan was a big deal, she just hit ghost types with Scrappy. Even before then, it had all the great stats you'd ever care about when battling with it. It moves fast enough, hits hard enough, and takes hits well enough. Sucker Punch and same type attack bonus fake out are also fun moves that it does well with. The worst thing about it is that most Kangaskhan probably just use fake out, sucker punch, some normal move, and funnily with how as a kid I always thought Kangaskhan was ground type, probably earthquake. It knows outrage when caught, which is kind of fun, but it's a lot more situational since it isn't a dragon type itself and the other moves that it could be using are just going to be useful a lot more often. Good at what it does, just not much else. The Great Horsey! Its highest level up move is learned at just 42, so whatever you want it to learn, it's yours. The Horsey family is a jack of all trades in terms of stats, and gets a, an amazing type once fully evolved. But there's really no need for Horsey itself. Why? Because Seedra! It's even more common than Horsey if you fish in the rippling water. It can also have all of its level up moves from 57, has more level up moves, and is generally a better place to start. To evolve, it requires a dragon scale, which we've already been able to reasonably obtain for a while, because on our first visit to Route 17 there was one right there, even though we couldn't get Horsey. If you want to just cut to the chase and not trade to evolve it, you don't have to worry about trading. 5% of the time in Rippling Water is Kingdra. 
it can be up to level 70 and has access to all of its level up moves at the same level that Seedra does. The Water Dragon type is one of my personal favorites, only being weak to dragon and having quad resistances to water and fire. Similar to Milotic, which seems to just be getting brought up all the time today, it really only uses a water move, an ice beam, and maybe a dragon move if it's lucky, but it's very balanced stats and interesting abilities just make it a fun water type to use that differs from the norm. It's one of those fun to use Pokemon that, and there's nothing to especially dislike about it. So I've never been sure what Goldeen actually wants to be. It's a slow physical attacking water type with the option to speed up and rain, which I guess makes it certainly unique. The main thing it has going for it are that it uses Waterfall decently well. In fact, this was the original Waterfall user before that was even an HM move. Other than that are physical horn attacks, which sure it does learn horn attack, but more importantly is horn drill and mega horn. They're probably the best non-water type moves for it. Its move pool is so shallow that even something as small as a Goldeen will suffocate in it. Return and Poison Jab are its only worthwhile physical moves other than that, and that's it. I guess if you really still want to raise it though, rarely found when fishing in rippling water, you can find Seeking in Striaton City. Not much different here other than it potentially being at a higher level. The family is just pretty lame between low stats, few moves, and even fewer good moves. I think you're better off just having a water type with higher stats, especially in the speed department. Staryu can be found commonly, but rippling water yields the greater treasure, very high leveled Starmie. This is the epitome of a Pokemon that's withstood the test of time. Always been great in both playing environments and sometimes for even separate reasons from game to game. In any environment, it learns several strong moves, has two great attacking types, and is known for its type coverage and power. In Versus, it's universally loved for being one of the best Pokemon to learn Rapid Spin so that it can get rid of entry hazards right away. Really? Just watch out for its general frailness and it'll be fine. Jinx, despite her storied history, is very good. She's pretty fast, has good special attack, and Psychic and Ice is a great dual stab typing. Pretty much any TM you'd ever want her to know is either already in your bag or coming right up. I guess we got back on track with Pokemon worth adding to the roster this far in, thankfully. Hey, I'm a beefy bug. My name is Pinsir. This one's interesting. Usually a Pokemon with very high attack isn't granted both bulk and speed in this capacity. Unless we're talking about my beloved Kragan, of course. It uses Swords Dance and X-Scissor. It has... A lot of fighting type moves to consider, oddly. Has Stone Edge and is a great user of Earthquake thanks to Mold Breaker getting through Levitate. On the note of Mold Breaker combined with great type coverage, it's just not walled by a lot of Pokemon and packs a punch against a lot of teams, and it leaves you with a bug type that's just cool. Heading back over toward the west, however, didn't want to waste your time walking all this way back. Son, have I a deal for you and you alone! Here's your chance, I will sell you the secret Pokemon Magikarp for an unbelievable 500 Poke Dollars. How about it, interested? Yep, we're ending the last new area on Magikarp. It's level five and exclusive to the post game. You don't want to raise it. If you still want to, I guess I can at least say that it'll evolve in one level due to how strong our opponents are now. What a weird note to end on. Lapras. If only you kept your beta name and you were still named Ness. You're a lot like Ness in that you are a slow offensive character with tons of HP. Lapras is a great switch in against water and ice moves thanks to its type and water absorb. And it's just a very likable Pokemon. I can't really explain why, it just sort of is. It learns a few moves that you might not have thought of before, like Thunderbolt that rounded out its type coverage very nicely. Really? Just watch out for the extra weakness brought upon by the ice typing and it should serve pretty well as a water type. Ditto hurts me. So we all know how it works. It uses Transform, and it has near exclusive access to that, which turns it into the target Pokemon and copies almost everything about them aside from HP. But its stats are so low that it seldom gets a chance to do this in a serious fight. You should totally catch one if you want to do something like breeding without access to egg moves, though. It's at least good for being able to breed with any Pokemon like the sweet little goo that it is. I liked you before it was cool.
I always picked Helix as a kid, but this isn't the Helix you know and love. Since then, Almanite gained access to Shell Smash, and already that makes it an intriguing choice. Between being tanky, having two good attacking types, and the option to use Shell Smash to sweep through other teams, this is actually a pretty darn flexible Pokemon despite what the Shell would have you thinking. I just watch out for its lower special defense and the fact that it's not the fastest user of Shell Smash out there. Next up is the counterpart of Kabuto, another Pokemon that's pretty decent. It's not that complicated. It used Swords Dance, Stone Edge, Aqua Jet, and Waterfall. It learns a few other good moves, but this is just so solid when it's backed up by all right speed and a pretty good attack stat. Plus, Swift Swim for its ability just makes it even better at doing it. It just kind of works. Two hits a lot of things, has some okay bulk, and really only needs to watch out for grass types. And the other Kanto fossil is here too. The first thing you think of Aerodactyl is what? Well, for me, it's actually been how it lives with that jaw, but besides that, it's speed all the way. Its type allows it to switch into a lot and then just attack like nuts. Both of its types are great, and it also has access to the elemental fangs through heart scales. Odds are, you'll be able to make a move set for this just with heart scales and TMs alone, considering how many we have access to now. It's a sweeper blessed with good resistances. Its abilities aren't particularly helpful to it, but hey, sometimes you don't need it, and a useless ability is certainly better than how the other rock flying fossil Pokemon got it. Munchlax is always holding the leftovers through this in game trade, and actually, I think maybe in the wild too, at least, well, never mind. Uh, through this in game trade, you always have the leftovers. And Chinchino is not hard to get, as I've demonstrated. If you want to use it, this level 60 baby Pokemon toward the end of your journey is your only shot at getting a Snorlax. I'd suggest taking it on a bike ride through Sky Arrow Bridge right away to get it happy enough to evolve. Its stats aren't bad for a baby, but at 5 speed, it is the slowest Pokemon in the known universe tied with Shuckle. Everyone knows Snorlax. Legendary stats and everything but speed. Great bulk, great damage, learns tons of great moves, we have a wide arsenal of TMs that we can unleash upon the world through its fists, too. It's an in-game trade that makes a great Pokemon even better. This Munchlax always has a neutral nature and will always have a perfect IV and HP and 20 and everything else. Great Pokemon. Here we are. Possibly one of the easiest ways to obtain Dratini in the wild ever. It's not rare in the slightest, and can potentially be caught with a high enough level to fully evolve after just two level ups. If you've saved your rare candies, congratulations. <laughs> anyway, we've had access to plenty of good dragon types for a long time now, and the Dratini family joins the ranks of the, of the great ones. Its family has no shortage of great moves. Thunder Wave, Agility, Dragon Dance, Outrage, the Elemental Punches, pretty much every good TM, whether it's physical or special. And I guess technically Hurricane if you're bonkers enough to raise this thing all the way up to level 81. It can fulfill basically any role and do whatever you want whenever you want, unlike the other dragons that have a lot more rigid roles. On rare occasions, its evolved form Dragonair can be encountered. It's the same level as Dratini and there's not any real reason to catch it as a Dragonair if you have trouble finding it. However, on a 1% chance while fishing on rippling water only, this is the rare chance to encounter a wild Dragonite. It will immediately be ready to fight for you if you can find it. Do I recommend trying for this? Hell no! Just level up your Dratini within the amount of time that it would take to find a 1% encounter. On the note of Dragonite specifically, it, it gained a hidden ability of multi-scale in this game, making it one of only two Pokemon to ever have this ability, the other being Lugia. This made Dragonite even more popular than it already was when it got this, but in your case, it's another really cool ability you can't have, so don't factor it into your decision to use it. Sentret is fairly mediocre, but at least it can evolve right away, no matter what level it's got at. Fully evolved, it is at least pretty fast, and that's unfortunately about it. It is not the worst Pokemon ever. Ever. It is good at using moves like Return, and it does get good TMs like U-Turn and Shadow Claw that gives it a bit more type coverage. It's just not outstanding and isn't particularly helped by either of its abilities because they're both pretty bad. I don't mean to make it sound like Ledian because I'm repeating a lot of the things that I said when talking about it, because it's really not that bad. It's just not really spectacular. 
Noctel, here's another special defensive weirdo. This one's surprisingly bulky in spite of its type not really being known for that. It learns a lot of psychic type moves as well, uses reflected light screen, and then roost. Another option that it has at its disposal is hypnosis, something that not a whole ton of flying types have. And on the flip side, its ability is nice when it gets the chance to actually be useful. Again, not a great Pokemon, so much as a mildly interesting one. Wow, uh, forget being nice to these lesser Pokemon now. Ledian is one of the worst Pokemon of all time. <laughs> Let's start with an overdone type that is one of the worst on both an offensive and defensive standpoint. Give it tons of attacking moves when it has simply laughable attack stats that aren't even good by baby Pokemon standards. And then for good measure, let's throw in a bizarre mix of all right speed and special defense being its only stats over 55. As if that's not bad enough, the actually good special defense is completely negated by it having next to no HP. So in reality, Ledian has five useless stats and okay speed that it won't even get to do anything with. Swarm is the better of its two abilities to be sure, but with that little HP and with its type the way it is, it won't ever be activating Swarm because it'll already be knocked out of its taken damage. Ledipin, Ledipin, <laughs> Ledian does learn some nice moves for Baton Pass like Agility and Swords Dance so it does work best as a lead, but it's absolutely awful. Everything it does is done better by other Pokemon, and there's no reason to consider it for a serious team, not even close. Even people I know who like making wacky teams of offbeat Pokemon have told me that Ledian disappointed even them. Seriously, this is beyond bottom tier and more like love disc tier. Ariados is a crummier physical-based Venomoth that learns most of the same moves. It learns Spiderweb, which is kind of unique, but is it a fair trade-off? No. Uh, Chinchou? Why are you a 1% encounter everywhere that isn't Driftvale City? You can find it co very, very commonly here, so what was the point of the- uh, whatever. Save yourself the trouble and all the pulled out hairs and catch it now if you want it. As you would guess, it evolves within one level no matter what it's caught at and has access to any move that you would ever care about as long as it's caught at level 45. Volt Absorb is a cool ability, making it a good switch in if your team has electric weaknesses. Save yourself more hairs by not catching it with Illuminate. Otherwise, it's a slow special tank with some pretty fun double stab attacking types and only two weaknesses with one immunity. Not the best by any means, but it has its fans for a reason. And rarely in Rippling Water, you can find a Lantern that's as high as level 70. If you're lucky enough to find it, it's about the best way to add this family to a team. Obvious, but no moves are missed by catching it fully evolved. Sun <laughs> the weakest of all Pokemon in terms of stats. You don't want to hear about it more. We're actually here to talk about Sunflora, who sucks a little less ass and can rarely be found around here. Sunflora is still bad. Pure Grass is a bad defensive type. It's laughably slow. Chlorophyll is about the stupidest ability they could have possibly given it. And it just gives off a general air of, eh, it's a slow grass type, so we'll give it something to deal with one of those two bad things. It feels like there wasn't much care or thought put into what it would actually get to do with that increased speed. It's meant to spam Solar Beam, but without another team member setting up Sunny Day for it, it just won't get a lot of chances to even do that. I guess you could say Trick Room is where it would shine brightest, but really just, just use other grass types, please. <laughs> Our swarm for the route is Yanma, getting the bad out of the way first. Bug flying is the most generic, awful type ever. But other than that, I don't know what else to say other than it's good. Learning ancient power is not a problem if you catch it at a decent level. Speed boost has always been one of the greatest abilities, has respectable special attack, gets good use out of both types between bug buzz and air slash, and while it's not an outright physical attacker, it's a competent U-turner as well with that great speed. Again, I just wish it came a little bit sooner so I could say it's underrated and that you'll get lots of mileage out of it because there just isn't that much journey left. Murkrow has a family with average speed, low defenses, and good everything else. Its Sucker Punch is one of the strongest priority moves on any Pokemon out there. It's also around the levels to be learning Night Slash and between Super Luck and the Scope Lens, it's fantastic at that. Foul play is another great move for it, but that's sadly where the positives and good physical moves end. 
Outside of the dark type, it learns a bunch of special moves, and it's pretty great at using those too. Hits very hard if it is a little bit average in speed. Evolution, dark grass, low level. Miss Drevis, you are one of my favorites. I've been waiting for you to pop up. The greatest thing about the Miss Drevis family come in the form of its speed and special attack. It's pretty expected in what it learns for that purpose as well. It would be a lot better if Nasty Plot weren't locked behind breeding, but Calm Mind is hardly a useless alternative when it has good special defense and three immunities that can help it with setting up. The main thing to watch out for is that it can't take physical attacks for beans. Evolution, Dark Grass, low level. There's no water on Route 2, but there is something blue, the Swarm Encounter of Why Not? More like why? <laughs> well, okay. Positives are that it at least evolves at level 15, so it's guaranteed to always evolve in one level. Wobbuffet's main gimmick is that it has a ton of health, so that it can use Counter and Mirror Coat, plus its ability cuts off the foe being able to switch out, unless both Pokemon have Shadow Tag, in which case they are both allowed to switch until one of them leaves the field. It can be a very powerful Pokemon, and is one of the best users of Leftovers ever, which we're not too far off from being able to get, and once Wobbuffet gets low on health, it uses Destiny Bond to bring down the foe with it. It does it well, but doesn't do much of anything else. If you know what your opponent's going to do, can be very powerful, but with unpredictable AI, it can be a little bit frustrating to use. It's good, just very one trick in what it does and might not be what you're looking for. Our swarm for Route 216 is Pineco, a pure wall and utility Pokemon if I've ever seen one. It evolves into Fortress, potentially right away, and it's the awesome bug steel type that everyone loves. <laughs> This is the kind of Pokemon that is loved in Versus, but can be kind of boring if used otherwise. It can use Toxic and Stall with Protect, lay down Spikes or Stealth Rock, and use Gyro Ball pretty well, plus even explode when it's done for a huge amount of damage. Where it probably shines best is being a solid wall that can set down entry hazards and then use Rapid Spin to get rid of a foe's entry hazards. Most surprisingly, it's actually compatible with Volt Switch, which I can't say I would have expected at first glance. Sturdy is a great ability now more than ever, so there's plenty good there as well. Its attack is better than you might think, but the one thing it needs to always watch out for is burns. What's next? Uh, um, another game? Another time that I talk about how much I like Dunsparce and wish it got an evolution. If you look at what Dunsparce is capable of, you can see that it learns a sheer abundance of great moves, almost to Audino levels, and it would get a lot of mileage out of that Serene Grace ability. It has so much going for it in the way of moves and in that ability, except its stats are just so awful and it doesn't come together. It seems as though they're more or less done with giving old Pokemon new evolutions in the present, but please, just go back and give Dunsparce one before you retire the practice for good. Please, I want Dunsparce to be good. <laughs> Second is Gligar. Flying ground. Uh, how's that? Uh, okay. Anyway, with good attack, defense, and speed, this is certainly a useful Pokemon in different situations. This is actually one of the more helpful post gamers, not only for its stats, but also just how many good moves it has. The elemental fangs are there, learns multiple useful dark and bug moves so you can experiment there with which ones you like best, and is one of the few Pokemon that can even learn acrobatics. You don't need me to tell you again how great that move is. We're a bit away from its evolution item, which does hit its usefulness a lot, but alternatively, if you don't want to wait, rarely rustling in grass is Gliscor. Completely bypasses the weight and makes it immediately great, but it's rare, so there's that. It's a little odd, being very good in the end, but is a smidge harder to recommend than I would immediately jump to due to the circumstances around obtaining it. Huh, right at home in Unova. Quillfish. I'm gonna be straight with you. I actually kinda like little Quillfish now. Hear me out. It is far from the best, and yes, its stats are pretty middle of the road, but with time, my opinion has been swayed for the better and I want to pass on the light that I have seen when it comes to Quillfish. First, its defensive typing is wonderful and it resists so many things. Seven types, in fact. Second, its water moves aren't all that bad, and with a somewhat respectable attack stat, it's a pretty good user of Waterfall. Third, 
it's a good utility Pokemon. It naturally gets spikes and toxic spikes, but thanks to the select TMs that are available in Unova, it can learn Taunt and believe it or not, Thunder Wave. Fourth, its speed stat is pretty good and it can actually take advantage of Swift Swim, unlike Luminion that doesn't know what it wants to do with it. And fifth, thanks to being a poison type, it can use Black Sludge for its item. This is really far from the worst Pokemon out there, and a lot better than I think most people think Quillfish is. The only part of it that I can say is outright as horrible as Quillfish looks at first glance is that it can't have Intimidate in this game, and there are many better Pokemon with Swift Swim when building a rain team. Overall, I would classify Quillfish as middle of the road, not trash and I'd recommend it if you want a fun challenge or something unusual that you've never tried before. I think I've made many points for it being worth something after all. <laughs> Shuckle, behold, the highest defense and special defense of all Pokemon. But that doesn't make it good. It's tied for being the slowest of all Pokemon with Munchlax, and that's not so bad. I wouldn't have that any other way, not only because it's so defensive, but also because mold growing on a rock is about as slow as anything comes. The name of the game with Shuckle is Toxic Stalling, either through encoring the opponent when you predict them, or just resting and healing up yourself. That is mainly what it does. I wouldn't say that it's a great Pokemon, but essentially it is strictly a wall, walls like no tomorrow, and you just keep healing up. The only merit it has on an offensive level at all is Power Trick, which averages the attack stats between yourself and your opponent. I still wouldn't build it around this, but it is there if you want it. Heracross is a lot like Pinsir in having beautiful attack with good speed and bulk that are at least respectable. Heracross is a bit more raw power with Guts being so easy to set off with the right held item, so it is a little bit different than Pinsir at least. It has great moves for both of its own types, has Stone Edge, has Earthquake, has Swords Dance. Isn't much else to say, it's very good and I think you'll like it if you never gave bug types much chance in the past. And we're following this up with another one of the best options out there for an ice type, Sneasel. Well, okay, maybe not completely accurate. The Racer Claw it needs to evolve will be found soon, so that's no trouble. It has Night Slash already, so that's good too. Oh. You might ask, where's the trouble? Ice moves. It can only get Icy Wind, Ice Beam, and Blizzard without breeding. Lack of Ice Shard and especially lack of Ice Punch are downright disappointing pointing for Sneasel. So, as good of a user as Sneasel is at Ice Slash, Brick Break, X Scissor, and Aerial Ace, it's unfortunate that it lacks two of its best moves. Not bad, but probably the weakest appearance Sneasel has ever had since it got its evolution. Piloswine! Easily one of the most useful ice types there is. It knows Earthquake upon capture, has access to Ice Fang and Rock Slide, then Ancient Power can be taught via Heart Scale so it can evolve immediately and has incredible attack and HP once it does. It's faster than it looks, too. Really? If you're still wanting an Ice type, this is one of the best options ever. The only big flaw is that there is no Icicle Crash on it without breeding. If you want it, don't catch it this instant. It'll be far higher leveled if you wait for the Dark Grass just up ahead. Mamoswine. This evolved form of Piloswine is a novelty. If you thought I was going to recommend that you catch this instead of the Piloswine at the beginning, no. The Piloswine that are found in the dark grass later in the Giant Chasm are higher level than yet again learn Ancient Power from a Heart Scale. There is no reason to pluck your hairs trying to catch a fully evolved Mamoswine, much less even be able to find it. I recommend it, just not caught in this fully evolved form. Corsola, only found when surfing in rippling water, which is way too much trouble for this sucker. I consider pretty much nothing about Corsola to be worth anybody's time due to no stat over 85, never evolving, and its stats being just so particularly bad in just the right places. It's like it's trying to be a wall, but it's just so slow, doesn't manage to be actually bulky, and can get smacked down by pretty much anything that's super effective. I wish you evolved, because you're real cute, and a coral Pokemon is a great idea. Told you Remoraid was coming up soon! Hopefully you thought it was clever and didn't just read the sidebar before this. This is a Pokemon that I would describe as not horrible, just outclassed. It's a mixed attacker with some pretty good oomph, average defenses, but moves slowly. You can see how those stats are interesting, just not blowing anyone away. 
Sadly, both of its abilities are normally pretty good on most Pokemon, but aren't useful specifically to it. Most of its good moves have imperfect accuracy as it is, and it doesn't learn high critical chance moves. If you just like Remoraid and want it, take advantage of the cool moves that it learns other than that other water types don't, because that is the biggest strength to be found on it. Signal Beam, Gunk Shot, Energy Ball, Charge Beam, and even Fire Blast are some cool examples of that. Type coverage is the name of Remoraid's game. As is the pattern, Octillery can be found fishing in rippling water, and it's pretty hard to find. Octillery specifically has a signature move, Octazooka. A 65 power, 85 accurate, special water type move with a 50% chance of lowering the foe's accuracy. Don't let the cool name fool you. It's a bad move with a ter terrible damage accuracy ratio. Octillery's already great at using Surf, Waterfall, and Hydro Pump, so why waste your time with Octazooka? Going on a downward spiral, are we? Delibird is an empty Pokeball. It's even the right colors for it! Don't lie! No stat over 75, no stat that isn't speed over 65, so what's it even going to do with that speed anyway? Delibird is one of the worst Pokemon ever conceived because it has some of the absolute worst stats ever, together with horrid defensive typing, never evolves in anything better, has no outright good abilities, and its only level up move is present. A signature move that is more like a badge of dishonor. Normal type, physical, 90% accuracy, and it does random damage. The most likely power that it will have is 40. The second most likely is 80. The next most likely outcome of present is healing the enemy by one fourth of their maximum HP. And the rarest outcome is 120 power. Nobody would ever seriously use this move over return, but I'll spell out the best case scenario for this move just for posterity. It can never be super effective. It is backed up by 55 attack. You have Hustle to buff the damage by 50%, but because of Hustle's accuracy drop, your lame signature move only has a 72% chance of even going off. Then, if you actually do roll the 72% chance to hit, then you have to roll an 80% chance to not heal your opponent, effectively a 57.6% chance of even doing a lame amount of damage at all, and then a simply intolerable 7.2% chance of hitting and doing more damage than return when return is 100% accurate. It'd be bad without present, but it's just an insult of a Pokemon with present. Starting us off, the one and only Fusion Evolution. That sounds cool. Mantike evolves when leveled up with a Remoraid in the party, and wouldn't you know it, Remoraid's coming up soon. As for its role, this is a pretty great special wall. Has a good defensive type and uses multiple great water moves and thankfully even learns Air Slash so that flying type is not purely a defensive boost. Unfortunately, that's about all it has. It's so-so at using special attacks and learns a bunch of physical moves that it can't use for beans. In Rippling Water, of course you can find Mantine at higher levels. For you black version players, we got Hound Hour for ya. It's mainly a dual stab special attacker that uses flamethrower and nasty plot together with its ability to switch into fire type moves and set up very quickly. Sadly, Dark Pulse isn't accessible for it on this journey at all, so Shadow Ball is going to be the next best thing for it. Not horrible, it's just a little bit more shallow than it has been in the past and a lot more shallow than it will be later on in the timeline. Stantler is a Pokemon that I wish was better than it was. It has a lot of individual great things going for it, but they just don't come together to form anything worthwhile. What are these positives I speak of because you thought Stantler was terrible? Well, Intimidate is one of the best abilities in the game. It doesn't have any great stats, but they're pretty good. It learns good physical moves of different types, complementing what it's good at. Zen Headbutt and Jump Kick are there from the start. These are all legitimate merits, but it just isn't as good at doing these things as so many other Pokemon. Buffalant and even Stoutland have just been factually better at so many of these things for so long. Smeargle! It's simple. It can learn every Pokemon move thanks to its signature move, Sketch. But it has horrible stats in turn. If you can dream up a moveset, Smeargle can use it. Best way to use Sketch is to enter a double battle and copy your own moves. Really, 
it can be hard to make use of it, but every Smeargle should have Spore since barely any Pokemon learn it, and 100% accurate sleep is one of the best things any Pokemon could ever have. Not much else to say here. Get creative. Pupitar! Oh. Oh, oh, I wish you came up earlier. Pupitar evolves into one of the best physical attackers of all time. Let's shift gears over to Tyranitar instead, because every Dark Grass Pupitar will evolve in one level, and that's what you're here for. With two good offensive types, simply unreal stats all over the place, a rare ability that summons Sandstorms right away that would already make it good pretty much no matter how crummy it would be otherwise, Rock types getting a 50% special defense buff from the Sandstorms that it automatically summons, and that leaves you with Tyranitar being a juggernaut, if there's ever been one. I'm sure you're already well aware of how great it works as a physical attacker, and I don't need to tell you about all that, so instead, I'm going to choose to bring up how it can actually work as a special attacker, and how it learns all kinds of crazy moves like Thunderbolt, Flamethrower, and Ice Beam, just to name a few. It even gets some interesting status moves like Hone Claws to use with Stone Edge to make up for that accuracy. Um, whatever type coverage you want or however mixed you want a moveset, Tyranitar can even deliver on that front. This is one of the strongest Pokemon we've ever seen and will ever see. Tyranitar is found rarely in Rustling Grass, but at a much lower level than the Dark Grass Pupitars that I recommended. For white, we have Poochiena. It's a pretty underwhelming dark type by comparison without any remarkable stats and winds up having to rely on Sucker Punch a lot because its speed is so poor for how low its other stats are. It hardly learns any physical moves to take advantage of its decent attack stat either. It's just not very good and one of the most mediocre dark types out there even when there's limited options. Swellow is lightning fast, but not much else. In the right situations, this can work. It's a great U-turn user, it hits hard with return, and to a lesser extent, Aerial Ace. It also has same type attack bonus Quick Attack to deal with other priority moves that would normally outspeed it. It's a great Pokemon to bring out once you're sure the opponent's counter to it is gone, and then just clean through the rest of their team with it. It definitely has its faults, though. And as a personal fan of Swellow, we still gotta talk about it. Brave Bird is only available through breeding, which definitely cuts into its already limited power. The other big fault is a big one, which is scary to hear since that apparently means the last one wasn't the big one. I've listed all the types of moves that it learns already, except the Dark. Yeah, it's just very situational, but when it gets going, it gets going. Here beyond Starmie, we find a Pokemon that is before its glory days. Wingle! Pelipper is encountered at all the same levels. While this family isn't amazing by any stretch, Pelipper gets interesting moves that aren't learned by a ton of Pokemon. Roost, Tailwind, and Hurricane are all great examples and it gets them all naturally with no need for tutoring. Even if this isn't the Pelipper that kids of today love using on their VGC teams, it still thrives in rain due to Hurricane and would be at home in any team that uses rain. Shroomish! Hey, look, it's the other Spore Pokemon that was done better than Paris. It can evolve at most levels it's caught at, has interesting abilities, super solid attack, higher speed than Parasect and Amoongus for getting off that Spore right away, and good type coverage. If you don't want a Sweeper, then Shroomish has got you covered there as well. The Toxic Orb has been available for ages, and it's great fun to use that with Poison Heal to stall out the enemy, doing damage in between Protects, Leech Seeds, and Spores. The downside of the Shroomish family is that it has to learn Spore as a Shroomish only, and it's at a high level. But you'd be trying to catch it at a high level anyway if it was a serious contender for your team, and it's well within the encounter range anyway. You can totally catch it at a reasonable level to learn Spore. Sableye has no weakness, but poor stats. Pretty bad stats. If its hidden ability were unlocked, it would have the gift of Prankster, but it just... Because it doesn't have that, it ends up being very weak, very slow, and doesn't have a lot to make up for it. To match Sableye, it's Mawile. Another Pokemon with poor stats, no access to the hidden ability that would make it better, and its bad stats are complemented by a not great offensive type to boot. I guess it has Intimidate and Swords Dance, which are its best strengths, but there just isn't much reason to use it. We got two swarms for the price of one, and neither of them are good. <laughs> 
Only in black version is Plusle. It's a generic electric type with mediocre stats. Everything you would ever want out of it can be done better elsewhere. The only part of it that stands out is that it gets Baton Pass, allowing it to pass the effects of Agility or Nasty Plot to a switch in. Oh, and its ability sucks because when are you going to be in double battles outside of Versus in the Battle Subway at this point? Only in white, you can find Minin, the defensive counterpart to Plusle, which is all you need to know about it. There are objectively worse Pokemon out there, but when Plusle is already so outclassed, and Minin is outclassed by Plusle, yeah. First route with two swarms starts us off with Volbeat, found only in black version. So it's kind of funny that this is the swarm on this route. This is the game that started the ability of Volbeat breeding with Ditto to be able to produce eggs containing both Volbeat or Illumise, confirming that the two are genetically related. Kind of awesome that they did that on the route where the daycare is located. Anyway, Volbeat kind of sucks. Its stats aren't terribly high, but it's the more offensive based of the two bugs that we're seeing here, and it actually learns a lot of good TM moves, even being another one of those rare Pokemon to learn acrobatics. If you do still want to raise it, please don't use it with Illuminate. <laughs> Yet another one of those abilities that transcends bad and is just annoying whenever you get one with a good nature. Volbeat, however, is notable for a couple of things that are unusual that I will give it some points on. It is one of only two Pokemon to learn Tail Glow, the other being Manaphy. This raises special attack two stages and is a great move. Plus, it's the only Pokemon in the game that naturally learns Flash through leveling up. So if you want to use Flash for a cave or something, you have a TM that does that infinite use anyway, but it's kind of fun, but yeah, it's a, kind of a bad Pokemon that's just notable for a few very specific things that have some novelty to them. Only in white version, you will find Illumise, the more defensive girl of the two. Unfortunately, not notable in any way compared to Volbeat. It straight up learns less moves than Volbeat, its stats are worse than Volbeat's for the kinds of things that it does, and Tinted Lens is the best thing it has going for it. Volbeat's Tail Glow combined with its attacking stats are the whole reason to use Volbeat, and Illumise has neither. Don't worry, white version players. This is a small price to pay. For soon, we will have revenge. Big time. The Pokemon impossible to not immediately think of when you see commercials for buying a car online, it's Carvana! Very common around these here parts, and even at a very high level. The Evolved Sharpedo can be found rarely by fishing in rippling water, and this is one of those Pokemon that have been available everywhere and people automatically assume it's bad because it's so common, but it's actually a pretty decent sweeper. Get it if you want an attacker, not what its ability might make it look like on the surface. I've talked a lot about how I like abilities like Rough Skin and the Rocky Helmet makes them even more potent, but use this with caution because its defenses are about as frail as a Lillipup, so don't think its ability is a sign for letting it take hits. Wilmer is a tough one to talk about. Tons of HP, pretty good mixed attacking stats, but just trash everything else. With weird and unhelpful abilities, bad speed, and even worse defense that doesn't do much to back up that HP very well make it makes it very unwieldy to use. A whale doesn't want to be in shallow conditions like this one. Whalmer winds up just using water and ice moves most of the time, and it has a couple of fun options like Earthquake, but it often doesn't get much use out of it due to being so slow compared to the electric types that it would be countering with that, and already having ways to deal with rock and fire. The biggest and best thing about Whalmer is the deadly water spout. This is 150 power, 100 accuracy, special water type damage that targets all adjacent foes. Barely any Pokemon learn this, and it's incredible! The catch is that its power reduces relative to the user's HP, and like we've seen, Whalmer is slow. It's not like the worst Pokemon of all time or anything, just very situational and takes good judgment to use. As you're probably getting tired of hearing, Whalerd can be found in the rippling water in Undella Bay, but not in Undella Town. Let's hope Altaria fares a little bit better. So, we got all pretty average stats with a focus on special defense. The idea of a tanky dragon is interesting, and its type is a mixed bag for doing that. Interesting resistances, but the flying type does a little bit more harm than good to a dragon. It does have access to Dragon Dance, but it just isn't as powerful as the other dragons of the land that could do the same thing. 
I'd probably use it at times when it's tight protects it, lay down a dragon dance, and then fight after I can set up thanks to my resistances. Another option is that Altaria is one of few Pokemon that can get Cotton Guard to buff its defense three times in one turn, but I'd personally prefer to have Dragon Dance on it in particular. Not unusable, but it's just such a weird average dragon to have come up so long after the others. Zangoose is a fun physical attacker that just feels unique. Your return TM is well used here, and it gets a lot of physical moves to make it even better, particularly of the fighting and bug type. Oddly, it learns almost every good special attack there is, even though it would almost never get any use out of them. It's clearly physical oriented, and it gets a lot of mileage out of Swords Dance. This is one of many instances of this, but in basically any location beyond Opelucid, I highly recommend going for dark grass encounters if they are available in any situation. For any encounter that is in both types of grass, you are going to find them a whole 10 levels higher in that dark grass. In the case of Zangoose here, that means it can learn all of its moves out of the gate. Surprisingly not version exclusive this time either, it's Zangoose's rival of Seviper. I like my poison types, but sadly this is easily the less good of this rivalry. It's a slow mixed attacker, poison is generally better when it's tanking than attacking, and even though it can do some fun unexpected things like use Earthquake and Flamethrower, seriously, who know this thing could do that? I sure as heck didn't know until I read up on it. It's just a case of these tricks being done so much better by so much else, and all it has otherwise are a bunch of normal and poison type moves. Shed Skin is often useful in single player, but that's about it. Well, we're going from the most flawed Pokemon that I like here to an outright bad one. Meet Lunatone. <laughs> with a lot of weaknesses, middle of the road speed, and without the strong physical bulk expected from rock types, it's left not being able to do much. It uses Psychic pretty well, and I guess a lot of Psychic types we've seen so far have been much slower than this, so it at least has that going for it among its Univan kin, but there's just not much of anything special about it. Thankfully, it at least has rock polish, but with so many woes holding it back, it just isn't anything that great. Hypnosis combined with Calm Mind is mildly interesting, though. Not much faring... Not faring much better is Soul Rock. Again, surprisingly no version exclusivity here. Soul Rock is more physically oriented, making it more of a traditional rock type, but it's still nowhere near as bulky as is usually expected from its kind. It is once again at least not moving at the speed of molasses, so there's at least that. I feel like Soul Rock got the better end of the stick, since its strong attacking move of choice usually winds up being Stone Edge, and it benefits from Sunny Day with so many fire type moves and Solar Beam together with removing its water weakness. Again, it's not necessarily good, but I think it at least fared a little better than Lunatic. I say it every time. Everyone loves the water ground type. It's wondrous. Barboach is common around these parts. It can have access to all of its moves at only level 47, including Earthquake through Level Up. Its evolved form Whiskash is rarer, only found in Rippling Water. It will always be level 60 and have access to all of its moves. It's a jack of all trades, master of none. It can take hits decently, does okay amounts of damage, has a good type, has good moves, but no abilities to write home about. But on the flip side, not horribly bad or anything. Just doesn't really like the world on fire, even though both of its types beat fire, so who would expect it to do that? Last of the three is Claydol. So, three defensive Pokemon in a row, eh? Well, Claydol is once again pretty fast for what it is, so we got two streaks going. And unlike Onyx, it actually hangs on to that speed in its fully evolved form. It's great for setting up against slower Pokemon and then taking hits after it sets up. It uses Calm Mind well. That or the screen moves are probably what I would recommend on it the most, but its status moves don't even end there if you want to do something like Toxic, but of course, everything and its grandma learns that. <laughs> its offensive stats might not be all that strong, but they are equal, which is kind of nice because it makes on-the-spot decisions a lot quicker to make. It does a lot of things, and does them pretty well, but it needs to be wary of how many common weaknesses it possesses. Working with Claydol is a matter of working with its type. Certainly not a bad Pokemon, just with a pretty glaring weakness. Lily, I like you. You confuse people with your weird type that no one ever remembers. I've screwed a lot of people over by using you and leaving them guessing what you were weak to again. <laughs> Mainly, it's there to stall out the enemy by taking hits and healing itself. 
Its type is not so awesome for this. It resists only normal and electric, but its defenses are so beefy that it manages to not take that much damage anyway. To help with that, it's going to mainly be using Amnesia. It can't get cursed without breeding, and stockpile is learned at a very high level. Its weaknesses are sadly pretty common too. Oddly, Grass Rock, when you look at it, seems like it would do a lot better on an attacker. Opposite to it is Anorith. We got another slow, bulky Pokemon that doesn't work too well because of its type. It's a harder hitter than its flowery cousin, but it's just very outclassed by so many other rock types. And we're beginning the after game on the rarest Pokemon ever, except not really. Instead of having it be stupid rare, just simply fishing on rippling water is enough to obtain Phoebus and Unova. As it is, it's useless and only knows Splash, Tackle, and Flail. It's Magikarp. It needs to evolve to be worth anything, and that's changed. This is the first region since Phoebus' introduction to not have Pokemon contests or contest stats. Instead, now the method of evolving it is trading holding a Prism Scale, an item only found in new areas that have opened up now. Speaking of evolving, found rarely in rippling water is Milotic. The big caveat that comes with using Milotic is that its move pool is shallow, and every Milotic winds up using Surf, Ice Beam, and maybe a Dragon move if it's lucky. Though very generic in moves, Milotic is bulky and very powerful in its special stats. If you want a good water type, Milotic is shallow, but it's good at what it does. Shuppet. Too low level to be useful, and it doesn't even evolve into that great of a Pokemon. If you want it to leave a lasting impression, read Bayonet's Pokedex entry, and that'll hurt you more than any attack this thing could use against you. Trapius is as unwieldy as it looks, and as unwieldy as it was the first time you tried to pronounce its name. It has two pretty good abilities that are powered up in sun. Clearly, it functions best on teams that take advantage of that. Its stats are a little all over the place, though, where it has decent everything except for speed. Um, it's not that it can't take hits, and it's not that it has the most weaknesses of any Pokemon. It's just sort of all right, I would say. It does pretty much what you would expect. It takes hits all right, has some types that it can switch into, and it learns pretty good moves of its types. Things aren't gonna get much better with Chimeco. It's pretty cute, but pretty lame at fighting. Low speed with just okay bulk is never a good combination, but it's at least all right at using Psychic when it does get to move. It does get some nice moves for support, like Yawn, but even then, most of its best moves are locked behind breeding. It's not the worst Pokemon ever, but it's just outclassed at everything, which I think some people might argue does make it the worst thing ever because it doesn't have much reason to exist, but I'm giving it some points here for the merits that it does have, even if it is very outclassed. Absol. So, it's not as beefy as Heracross, and it's not too fast, but that attack stat is great, and it's definitely one of the best dark type attackers out there. It learns a few physical moves with high critical hit chance, and it has Sucker Punch for when it can't outspeed anything. It's a bit too situational to be your dedicated sweeper, but it can do well if used against the right foes. This is another offbeat Pokemon that I still like and think is far from the worst. The Sphiel family is up next, and it appears only in the winter waters. Water and Ice is a good dual stab. It gets great moves for both, but not a whole lot else. Seems like I'm saying that about a lot of move pools today. I guess we're in shallow waters. It's slow with good stats everywhere else and has good bulk, but be warned, it only resists its own two types. It usually performs best by using either ability to its edge and stalling with Toxic, then just attacking whenever possible. Just middle of the road here. Celio can be caught at perfectly fine levels to evolve right away, but Celio and Walrein are both caught in the same place. Celio's not hard to find in Rippling Water for once, so there's the ease of availability over the many other water types that we have seen. Definitely something that this family has going for it. Clam Pearl. So here's something interesting. We have a tanky water type that evolves into one of two Pokemon that aren't the least bit tanky. Technically, this does mean that Clam Pearl fulfills its own role separate from its evolutions, and in fact, the Deep Sea Tooth doubles its special attack and Deep Sea Scale doubles its special defense. Maybe even better than the Eviolite for it. The most notable thing about Clam Pearl itself is that it's one of few Pokemon to learn Shell Smash, one of the best buffing moves out there. We've been over it many times. It has to be level 51 as a Clam Pearl only to learn it. But in this specific scenario, it can be caught that high in the wild for once. 
With the Deep Sea Tooth, which we already got down on Route 17 and 18, Clam Pearl will evolve into Huntail, who kinda stinks. So, of course you want to keep Shell Smash from the Clam Pearl stage, even if Huntail is not tanky. It's a slow mixed attacker with a fair bit of defense. It's the more physical of the two Pokemon Clam Pearl can evolve into, and just doesn't learn many moves to take advantage of it. Plus, Waterfall is weaker than Surf, and with it being so slow, it's not going to get much use out of the flinch chance to make up for it. In many ways, it's Caracosta, but not as good. As such, it doesn't have Aqua Jet, which would be nice for what it does. It can be caught in the wild rarely in Rippling Water in black, but why gimp yourself from not having Shell Smash? As with any duo, the more special oriented of the two is Gorbis, who is a lot better as it actually gets moves to complement what it is. It's just as slow as Huntail, so it does benefit a lot from Shell Smash, and not much else to say. It's basically Huntail, but with its stats flipped and with more moves to benefit what it does. Not great, but it at least works better than the alternative. Again, it can be caught in the wild and white, but don't do it unless you seriously plan to use it. Next up is Relicanth. I guess back on the note of Pokemon being outclassed by Caracosta, here we are. It has some good defense and HP, making it pretty tanky. Thanks to it being part water type, it's particularly good at out-tanking fellow rock types. It's also a decent waterfall user, though again, it's pretty slow and won't always get to take advantage of that flinch chance. The main reason to use Relicanth is the unreal damage from Head Smash and same type attack bonus with no recoil thanks to Rockhead. But sadly, it's learned at level 78 and isn't viable except for that reason. In short, it has some interesting toys and isn't totally useless, but it falls short of how good it could be. Oh! <laughs> Why do I have to talk about this thing every time? Nobody likes you! If you just stopped existing and your item lived on as the only part of your lineage, we would be all the happier for it. Okay, love disc. For the whole two of you that were considering it for your team, listen up and listen good, because I ain't gonna repeat myself until next game. I kinda contradicted myself there. No stat over 65 other than speed, which, if speed is the only thing you have going for you, then what is the point of having high speed? Its entire game is Rain Dance. To take advantage of that Swift Swim, use Hydra Pump or Surf with the boosted power from the rain, and I guess throw in an Ice Beam for good measure. But even then, it's so weak that there's probably hundreds of other water types that are better than it that we've already been able to catch at this point. I hate to give a Pokemon no chance at all, but it really is a case of, if your opponent resists both water and ice, they automatically win. In tradition, I like reading Smoggin's overview of Love Disc because they're always so great at summing up how bad it is better than I can. So for Gen 5, they wrote, Love Disc gets the award of worst fully evolved Pokemon for three generations straight, which is something, I guess. A plus. Metang is encountered in the mid-level 60s. Utterly unreal for how hard it used to be to fully evolve this family. Just level it up one time and BAM! There's one of the best Pokemon that could ever be found on anyone's travels. Immunity to stat lowering. Unreal attack and defense. Lots of great moves too. It's one of the select few that I actually recommend agility on because it's, oh, I don't know, slow and would benefit from it? Seriously, wondrous Pokemon here, and the only real caveat is that Steel isn't that good of an attacking type, but you get tons of resistance out of it, so who's to say that that's bad? As you'd guess, it can rarely be caught as a wild Metagross, but there's no reason to do it because it's 10 levels weaker than the herds of Metang that you can find in the dark grass nearby. Oh. You made fun of him, but the barrel is back with a vengeance! Both abilities are good fun, even if its stats are pretty low. Simple is such a negative name for an amazing ability because you want to give this amnesia, you want to give this work up. Any sort of buffing move makes up for its low stats completely. Waterfall is the natural choice for it. It can use superpower and it has rare access to super fang, but it's the kid who tries hard in the face of bullying and you gotta respect. And, um, next in the encounters is another awful bug type, so we're not stopping. Cricketune! You like its cry, but similarly, it uses Swords Dance and has Swarm, which it'll almost never get to use because its stats are so low. 
Thankfully, it can actually use moves like X Scissor, Brick Break, and Night Slash decently well, so it's not as bad as Ledian. Other than that, very mediocre. It's pretty awful, but at least we can all agree that its cry is hilarious. Cranidos Crush! Feel its wrath! <laughs> this is the epitome of Glass Cannon. Utterly ruthless attack, but very weak in all other ways. It tends to work best as a wall breaker since it's just fast enough to outspeed the really bulky Pokemon and can just utterly blast through them. Its best nuke attack is Head Smash, a 150 power physical rock type move with one half recoil damage. It doesn't learn it until level 58, but it isn't helpless until then since we have good TMs for it already. And last of the fossil Pokemon is Shieldon. There are far better existences than having your face be a shield. <laughs> In all senses, this is strictly a wall. It packs a ton of great resistances to back up those extremely tight defensive stats, but unfortunately, that's about where the good ends. Bastiodon hits so lightly, even for unevolved Pokemon standards, and it winds up only really being able to stall out the enemy. It's also a shame that it has the very specific weaknesses that it does, since it winds up not being able to do much a lot of the time because the exact moves that wreck it are so common. I think there's been better tanks than this, and there will be better tanks than it coming up. For the love of Sinnoh and Don Socks, don't catch a male combi. It might be one of the worst Pokemon ever, with these being its fully evolved stats together with the type that it has. I have had so many people who've caught this, raised it to like level 50, and asked me, hey, when does Combi evolve? <sighs> Rarely, the scare of catching a male Combi can be avoided completely by catching a fully evolved Vespiquen in the wild. It's in better straits, but it's still not that great. It's a tanky bug flying type, which is already a little bit questionable. It works well against fighting grass and ground, of course, but not a lot else and is weak to many common types. If it wants to tank, it thankfully has Toxic Protect and Heal Order, which is a signature move that restores 50% HP without the ground susceptibility of Roost that other flying types would have to deal with. It also has unique access to Defend Order, which is just Cosmic Power, and Attack Order, which is a 90 power physical bug type move with a high critical chance. Basically, a factually better x -Scissor. Attack and Heal Orders are definitely recommended for any moveset that it could possibly have for Versus. The other interesting option that it has is Power Gem, since Rock certainly helps type coverage for a bug type. It's just a pretty basic Pokemon in what it does, and doesn't really do a lot more than that. Bweasel! So it's really cute, but what I want to talk to you about mainly is its evolved form Floatzel, which can be found, of course, in the same waters as it, as high as level 70, in fact. It is very fast, especially for a water type, and yeah, it's a mixed attacker with a focus on physical. It does get water type moves and even some ice type moves to complement this, and just generally, it's kind of a sweepy Pokemon. Only thing that I'd watch out for is that Ice Punch is not available for it, so you're using either Ice Beam or Ice Fang through a Heart Scale. Cherim. I wonder how many people think Cherim is some kind of eggplant and have never seen what it actually looks like. You can see it on screen right now just in case you've never seen it. It's so cute that it only makes me wish I liked it more as a fighter. It's based around Sunny Day and is best used in doubles or triples because of that simply stellar ability. Mediocre stats across the board in pure grass type don't help what's in an incredibly generic move pool. If you don't believe me, its level up and TM moves are entirely grass moves, normal moves, toxic, sunny day, and rest. I've just listed every single move that Cherim learns. There's nothing quite like Drift Blim. I don't mean it's good, I just mean that there's nothing quite like it. Immediately, this screams tank. Drift Blim has one of the highest HP stats of all Pokemon, and its type grants it three very useful immunities. Sadly, those defenses backing up that HP are downright puny. To make up for it, Drift Blim is able to learn Stockpile, but it's still not a lot. Generally, the way to go is to have Unburden for its ability and use a gem to boost damage when activating Unburden. This is so much more viable in Versus because in single player, gems get consumed forever after one use instead of just to the end of the fight. But, hey, can I just see how cute its ability is? I mean it. It's so cute to imagine this thing dropping its hot air balloon basket because it's straining too hard to carry the cargo and getting faster because of it. I'd expect nothing less simultaneously cute and gruesome from a ghost. 
All right, well, it wouldn't be a region of tanky psychic types without you, Bronzong. We haven't forgotten about you. It has great defense, lots of resistance, as many as two immunities. It has two weaknesses to ground and fire, and I love, love, love the idea of a tank with only one weakness, and you get to choose what weakness it has. Levitate is definitely the better option on most teams, to be sure, but the option is there if you still want it, and I think it's just really nice. I'm tangenting a lot on this one, but a personal favorite strategy of mine is to pick Levitate, teach it Rain Dance their heart scale so it has no weakness, and beyond just having good stats and abilities, it stalls with the screen moves and uses Gyro Ball for attacking. Simple, but nice. A level 50 baby Pokemon? If you say so. Riolu evolves through happiness and... Daytime. That's kind of an awkward way of wording it. I didn't know where I was going with that. Which, should you want to go for it, you do have the Soothe Bell, you do have massages, you do have your bicycle. When it evolves, it's a great attacker that learns loads of great moves. It can function in situations that other attackers can't because it gains a steel subtyping, granting it awesome resistances. It can set up with Swords Dance, set up with Calm Mind, or set up with Work Up because it learns so many great physical and special moves. Only negative thing that I can really even say is that it doesn't have as many special TMs that it's able to get, but it can get special moves through other means. The Lucario pedigree is awesome. Hippopotas has the very real capability of knowing all of its moves as soon as it's caught, including Earthquake. Its ability summons Sandstorms just for entering a battle, and in Generation 5, it still is the good Sandstream that summons a permanent Sandstorm until it's overwritten by other weather. This is amazing! And if you'd want to use it alongside a Rock-type on your team, they gain a 50% special defense increase during Sandstorms. Hippowdon is very durable against physical attacks and just has a very nice type for a weather summoner when they usually don't have the best defensive prowess. Hippowdon also learns the elemental fangs through heart scale, and I recommend ice greatly for this. The only real things to watch out for with this one are special moves and the fact that it really needs to be able to take hits well after switching in because it's so slow. Other than that, this is one of the most solid Pokemon that we have seen yet in this postgame. Krogan. It's a physical attacker that learns a lot of poison fighting and dark type moves. Is that bad? Not really, no. It can learn both Swords Dance and Bulk Up and a uh, nasty plot for some reason, so it can definitely set up in different situations. It's built to function on Rain Dance teams the most since the, its immunity to water with dry skin makes it so that the buff water type moves received in Rain cannot possibly be used against it. All the while, it's gonna passively be recovering health in the situation. Mainly, just give it a life orb, give it the above mentioned health recovery options to cancel out the effects of the life orb, and it'll serve you very well being ridiculously annoying in the process. In Versus, it's also a good user of Substitute for these reasons paired with the Black Sludge. Overall, a pretty nice Pokemon with a unique type. Finneon! Ugh, it's bad. Aside from a few interesting move options, it's a painfully average water type that no one ever remembers. What about those interesting moves, though? U-Turn and Silverwind are about it. That's all it has going for it to separate it from every other fish. You can catch Luminion here by fishing in Rippling Water without needing to evolve Finneon, but it's pretty irrelevant, and there's so many better water types available now that we have our Super Rod. Heck, there were good water types you could get with the Super Rod back on Route 1 in Phoebus and Milotic. I don't even understand what they were going for when they made Luminion. It's not even a speedy tank, it's just slightly above average speed Pokemon with slightly more bulk than either of its attacking stats when pretty much all of its good moves are attacking moves? Sure, I guess it's fast on rain teams if you go for Swift Swim, but it doesn't have anything to take advantage of going first. It's just forgettable and I have no idea why it came back as an encounter besides looking really pretty. Rotom is a decently fast user of Shadow Ball and Thunderbolt. Not much else to really say there. Eeks is its name. Eeks. <laughs> uh, if we take our Rotom back to Shopping Mall 9, it's mounting a cardboard. The full electronics don't sell anymore. They're just going to waste. I wonder if someone could put them to good use. Oh, Rotom would like to investigate the motors of, elect of the electrical appliances. Is that okay? Why, yes, Rotom is motor spelled backwards after all. I see nothing more fitting than having these two things neutralize each other. You can have Rotom enter the microwave oven 
the washing machine, the refrigerator, the electric fan, the lawnmower, and my favorite electrical appliance, the one that had a mandatory recall. <laughs> if you put him in any of these, he is going to try to learn a signature move of whichever appliance you use. The microwave oven has overheat, the washing machine has hydro pump, refrigerator has blizzard, electric fan has air slash, and the lawnmower has leaf storm. These are all pretty great. We're gonna do one for sake of example. And we're trying to learn overheat. If you were to change him to another body that he can inhabit, then he would just simply have this move replaced by whatever the signature move of that one is. We're gonna get rid of charge. And this is truly what makes Rotom special. Without this, he's all right and a decent user of the moves. But now, he's a different Pokemon. He's even a different type. The appliances are no longer ghost type. They are electric and whichever the special move of that form is. This makes them even better because now they get the same type attack bonus when they didn't back in Platinum. Wash Rotom saw some great viability from this change especially, but really, I wouldn't call any of them outright useless aside from just how late they become available. I wish there was some game that had Rotom available early and not locked behind a bunch of hurdles because transforming it periodically as you progress would be so fun and useful if you knew it was coming up. The only reason to not use the appliances other than type is that vanilla Rotom has higher speed. All of the other stats are higher on these appliances and their base stats are the same across all of them. The only difference is the type and the move. That's pretty fun. Like with every new area that we explore that has grass in it, we have new Pokemon to meet. We have a lot of new Pokemon to meet. So, let's get to it. <gasps> too late to be helpful, 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 too late to be helpful. Can be fully evolved at level five, which is kind of fun, but I guess you could always breed it to have a level one Porygon Z if that's your novelty. Too late to be helpful, too late to be helpful. Well, it certainly would make a handsome paperweight. Too late to be helpful, 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 too late to be helpful. Sucks. Too late to be helpful, 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 too late to be helpful. Too late to be helpful, too late to be helpful, too late to be helpful, too late to be helpful. Is this a bath toy or something like that? That's yet another Pokemon I want made into a bath toy because it looks like it was born to be one. What a strange and interesting insult that could be taken many different ways. Born to be a bath toy. Hmm. I surprise even myself at times.